And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Singularity Lab, your home for stories in breaking science, technology, and futurism. My name is Michael Mataluni. Joining me today is my co-host, Luis Jimenez, creator of the Unidentified Celebrity Review and the Big Phone Home. What's going on, brother? What's shaking, dude? Good to see you. I know, dude. It's great to see you. I'm excited. We got a, a killer show today. Um, we have uh, people people on Twitter have been like excited about this trio that we've got in store oh, yeah, for you man. guys. Well, I mean, why wouldn't you be? <laughs> in the last year, they've released a lot of great information and articles and made the topic a lot more fun to talk about every day. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And to, to address it from a, from a scientific perspective, I really appreciate and, uh, and, and the, the journalistic rigor that they put their stories through, I think is, is incredibly important. But before we get to that, Luis, mm -hmm. we're going to do what we always do at the beginning of every Singularity Lab episode. We are going to talk about one logical fa fallacy or cognitive bias. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically your brain trying to uh, make light work of a, of a, a lot of sensory information. So if you have cognitive bias or logical fallacy, just remember, it's not your fault, but we can identify it and, uh, and, and freaking fix it. All right, so today's logical fallacy is, or excuse me, cognitive bias is the mm -hmm. Dunning-Kruger effect. Have you ever heard of this? Oh, I have heard of this, where you think you're really <laughs> good at something, but you're actually terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know who's got, you know who is, where this is rampant? in mm. sports talk radio land, mm. where all of these, all of the, everyone who's comment, and it's, maybe it's kind of like with this topic too. Like everybody who comments on this stuff, for example, basketball, professional basketball or football, they've never played professional basketball or football. Mm. And so they're, they're trying, they're, you know, they're playing this Monday morning quarterback and they think they know better because they've seen it all, you know? Right. And it's like, you don't know anything. You've never actually had to face down a 300, you know, or 280 pound linebacker coming at you full speed, you know, where you have to make a decision in real time. Like you don't like, you don't know. You don't know. Well, and the uh, same so. thing can be for for Monday uh, morning political quarterbacks, mm -hmm. Monday morning, um, you know, judicial quarterbacks. Everybody, everybody knows <laughs> everything about everything. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Well, people commenting on governments and UAPs and how this is actually going to work, even though none of us have a government job or have ever worked in government ever in our lives. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but, it's, hey, it's hey, hey, here we go. Uh, we fun. have a. Our donation from the meat cutter. What's going on, brother? Glad to be able to catch this live today. Woohoo. Daily reminder to all don't drink the Kool Aid. Peace and love to you all. I think he's trying to avoid the Dunning Kruger effect. Mm. Um, but we've got a killer show today. And I'm just so excited that you all are here. Akashi Chris, welcome. Matthew Rye, it's great to see you. Grandmaster UV, James Doyle, uh, Fifi, Simon Fly. What's going on, you guys? Great to have you. Um, again, great show today. For those of you who are living under a rock, uh, we've got the Debrief Founder Squad. If you don't know who that is, it is a news site providing a public venue for credible reporting on science, technology, and defense news with an eye for the cutting edge and technology of tomorrow. Right up our alley here. Uh, our first guest is actually an investigative journalist, lead investigator for the Debrief, and co-founder, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Tim McMillan. Nope, you're muted, Tim. He'll get. He'll get it. He'll get there. He'll get it. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry guys. It's, it's ten o'clock at night over here in Germany. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Why am I the first guest? I'm on a shit show over here. I can't even unmute my mic. I literally, you know, it's backstage, so nobody gets to see it. But I'm sliding right in here at ten o one. Like, what's going on, guys? That's what's shaking, really right? Good. Well, we yeah, appreciate yeah, it, man. We know it's late night over in Germany, so it's so it's always appreciated when you could join us. Yeah, no biggie, man. I'm always it's always a pleasure to be here, man. This is this is one of my favorite shows. We always amazing. Have fun. Well, we appreciate it, and um, we're gonna bring in uh, somebody who is uh, extraordinarily important at the debrief. Uh, he's also a writer, podcaster, historian, and futurist. Co-founder of the debrief, ladies and gentlemen, Micah Hanks. Micah, what's going on? <laughs> How are you guys doing? Hopefully the audio is okay this time. How do I sound? You sound you great. Sound great. And you look one. great. That's what yeah. we're aiming for. You know what's funny is I had this entire camera set up for this this time, and I, you know, I got the memo right. You're supposed to wear ties when you're hanging with you guys. 
I shot a message over to Tim, but bless him. He's had so much going on. It's okay if he didn't get the memo. We, we yeah. already have our first you, disagreement you on the show. Me, he, he sent me the memo and <laughs> two minutes ago. Just so we're on the same page. Well, Next just so everybody knows, it's it's not a prerequisite to come on this show with a tie. Honestly, this was Mike's doing. <laughs> This was all his like. This was all his thing. Yeah, Actually, was like, it was it was like Michael Stone was doing this sh every show in a tie. I was like, well, I are we doing ties? Because one of us just can't wear a tie. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I'm doing a tie. I'm like, all right, I guess we're doing ties. That's that's where that's where we're going. So that's well, the birth of that. <laughs> it's actually funny you mentioned that, Luis, because uh, a little birdie came in my ear uh, quite a while back when I was still um, shooting some shows for the debrief at th at their YouTube channel, and this gentleman kept picking kept picking at me. What, what you just there's something about it, Mike. You know, every time I come on, it's like I'm just missing something. It's just there's a certain level of professionality. Maybe you should consider a tie. And I was like, man, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not too. I'm not too into that idea. And he was like, just just consider it. And so I tried it, and I was like, this is actually not that bad. Uh, this gentleman is Christopher Plain, who is that birdie in my ear, fiction writer, comedian, and lead science writer at the debrief, ladies and gentlemen. Christopher Plain, the man responsible for the ties. How the hell are you? Uh, I don't know who Chris Plain is. I'm MJ Benias, the third founder. Of the I'm going to say. I've heard all three founders were going to be on. And, uh, After that lead up, he showed the day off, like and Magnum I was for it. So. Hey, listen, That's me. By, See by right the there. Power. It says, right there. It says MJ Benias. Right. Uh, if, it's, if it's written down, it's true. That's Lord, right. That's the, that's the rule of the debrief. If it's written down, it is true. Exactly. <laughs> right. We Let know me our tell you about the ties since you bring it up, Madaloni and Luis Jimenez. Here we go. Got put your names right today. Um, please, please, MJ, you know, I go told on. Mike back when he was working at the debrief, I said, I have this problem. I know you, and I know you're smart. I know you're a great interviewer, and you have such credibility on the air. But every time I watch your show, there's a couple of minutes right at the beginning where, like, it just feels like a garage show. It's guys casually dressed. The backgrounds weren't that together early on. And I said, you need to really, you know, consider when I when I ran comedy shows, I always told the host, you wear a tie. Every comedian wants to dress casual. That's fine. But the host is the host. It should feel like you're hosting a show. So I'll admit, I'll take credit and guilt for that one. I told Natalie, <laughs> an effing tie on you embarrassment. I shouldn't have to learn that you're smart over and over again. So. <laughs> it's even funnier that you're dressed like Magnum P.I. right now, too. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> the whole time you <laughs> yeah. we're, like, we're waiting for you to be in a tux. Yes, yeah, that is my okay. look. Yes, I'm just I'm Magnum. waiting for I'm waiting to see the Ferrari or the helicopter. I mean, where where right. do we park those? That's right. Right. It is, it, I, it, it is funny. Jim. It is funny, MJ Benias, the fact that you know you 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 are you're so great at giving uh, extraordinary advice, but but it doesn't seem like you take your own. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, the hosts should be in ties. <laughs> the should be comfortable. So that's the rule. It's there. true. Like, I would we... like to say, as MJ Benice, my top three things are uh, whatever. That's a top MJ. Also, you start every sentence with either look or listen. So you go listen. All right, look. So those are the top MJ Benice things. And the third one is uh, not showing up for founder shows. So. <laughs> oh, gauntlet. <laughs> Jeez. Nice. Yeah. Uh, he's got kids. He's got a life. What can I, I, I can't. I, I'm, I'm curious to know what the employment status of Christopher Plain will be on Monday. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Former debrief right here. We'll be on the we'll be on the show as new guest co-host. <laughs> oh, oh wait, did you just give did you just give that to yourself? You might want to run that by MJ. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> By All the right, way, so I have a question before you. What get is this, the Chris Plain show? Like All right, what do you mean you have so, a question? I got a question. <laughs> what is this warp bubble everyone keeps talking about in my Twitter? Did I say something about a warp bubble? You sure somewhere? did. You, you sure dropped, did. yeah, you dropped a hint uh, several months ago. It seems like at this it point like that, right? that you were going like to that, that 
that you had a great piece coming out about a warp bubble, but you know, I haven't seen it, so I don't know if it's true. That's right. Mm. That's right. Well, I I can let everyone know that that piece is done. So uh, it will be edited either tomorrow or over the weekend, and you will all see it Monday. That I can finally say. So, wow. Well, all right. Yep, the warp bubble piece is coming. Well, and it's can, a real warp bubble. It's not we, an analog. Can we talk to you about it on Wednesday then? Uh, you know, I'm going to be on the Micah Hanks show on Tuesday. <laughs> And I'll be giving a lot of details on that show, but there's a possibility. Let me, all right, let me, let me all check right. with the bosses. Ch- check with the boss. Check with the bosses. Look at the schedule. Let me know. That's right. That's right. That's uh, all I'm done. Bye. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so okay. It's no longer the Chris Plain show. All right. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna rewind here for a second. Um, I'm I'm I- incredibly curious about how the debrief, how the founder squad actually came together. Um, you know, what inspired uh, you know, you, Tim and, and Micah and MJ Benias, what inspired <laughs> you to come together? What brought you together to uh to launch this bad boy? Because I mean, you're still what are we looking at? What are we a year and a half, two years old now? Just a year. A Just year. A year. I, I'm gonna let I'm gonna Just let Micah give the really eloquent nice answer and then i'll I'll give you the 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 blunt true answer but yeah go ahead take it away (laughs) you'll you'll fill it in certainly well uh you know again uh we we deputized uh chris plain to be here on mj's behalf but uh if you go back far enough really there is a little more than just a year to the debrief because tim and i've been talking about this i mean probably tim wasn't it I guess the the summer of probably 2019 when we the, the real genesis of the idea took place and then once the pandemic of course changed the world everybody was stuck at home and looking for new projects to get into if you're like me you've already got eight but you're like hey you know why not i'm not going to be leaving the house for a little while except to run to the store you know and even then you got to go through a full sterilization process so yeah we we figured it would be an ideal time uh, to launch a media enterprise but i mean in truth the way that people got their news uh, did change fundamentally during the pandemic. And had it not been for the World Wide Web and the interconnectedness of the world, you know, I don't know that we necessarily would have been making the kind of progress through this pandemic that we've seen uh, it, compared to past instance, instances like the Spanish flu, of course. So with history on our side and with a, a forward looking mindset, we decided to formalize things. We were in talks, of course, for a number of months. And finally, launch day came along just about a year ago. So, I mean, there was this incredible buildup. And once we got off the ground, you, you hear that expression, hit the ground running. I think we hit the ground, stumbled, rolled, jumped back on our feet, then sprinted. And here we are today. That kind of gets us to the to the current moment. And and we have had no shortage of news and, of course, have had our fair share of stories that we've broken in a variety of areas. But again, you know, one word that comes to mind here, singularity, that one being, of course, uh, very apropos considering that we're in the sing- singularity lab. But again, you know, futurism, artificial intelligence, all these kinds of things, science, technology, biotechnology, fuel, energy, and, of course, unidentified aerial phenomena, something that has really been uh, preeminent on a lot of people's minds. You know, we've been covering all these things for the last year, and I'll let Tim tell you what a wild ride it's been. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun, man. Yeah, no, that was everything Micah said is true. Uh, the, the blunt answer to that is uh, indeed, me and Micah were talking about this for a long time, and I just, me and Micah are good buddies. I just wanted to hang out with my buddy and work. You know, that's what it, that's where it comes out. So I'm like, this would be fun. And and MJ came along. Uh, He's like, kind of like, he was kind of like the kid in school that had a car and me and Micah didn't have a car at the time. So you're like, yeah. (laughs) So you're like, he can get us to the parties. You know, like, yeah, yeah. So we brought MJ along and yes, no, it's, it's been fun. And it's interesting that it's been, we just hit our year mark this week. And it kind of passed me by. I think it was Chrissy who, who in our, in our, work company discussion was like, guys, isn't it the one year anniversary? I'm like, gosh, I guess it is. Um, and so I, I think, uh, I think it passed me by because it, I never doubted that it wouldn't, you know, it's one of those things that it's kind of like, you know, going back to the sports reference that, uh, Luis opened up with, you know, you don't do the touchdown dance afterwards if you expected to score, 
And mm. that's kind of how it felt. And, and I think uh, that would not have been possible if it wasn't for people like uh, Chrissy Newton, who is joining us looking like Chris Plain, both <laughs> integral parts of like, everything we do. Um, <laughs> you know, there's so many people that kind of came along. So we started this little Goonies journey to go find this lost treasure of just hanging out with your friends, having fun and having adventure and sharing fun news. And we added more Goonies along the way. And so it's been fun. It's been really, really fun. And uh, it's exciting. I guess you you guys have the scoop of our one year anniversary week. Here we are. I may do a well, touchdown. Congratulations. Okay. It's 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 duly deserved. You guys work incredibly hard um, on the pieces that you put together. And I know. Uh, we'll give uh, Chrissy Newton here here an opportunity to speak as well on on what um, what what he has done. Uh, but Chris Plain, why don't you share with us a little bit about how you got started with the debrief and and what inspired you to join uh, join up with the Goonies? <clears throat> you know, money. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of reached out to me and they said, "Look, for a writer of your caliber, we know it's going to be a couple of grand a week, um, and you know, a limo and all of that." And uh, I sent them over the front side rider and they met all my demands. So here I am. That's incredible. Here. Great story. It's true. Expert. Absolutely true. Oh, that that was the better right. one. Yeah, no, I don't, I barely get paid crap, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's uh, you know, it was one of those things where I'm a writer. I've been writing for many years. Books uh, come from a stand up and sketch comedy background. And I have a tremendous infant uh, interest in science technology and a little bit in UFOs, as you guys know. And so I was just a fan. I was just a guy uh, following UFO Twitter, following Micah Hanks, listening to the Micah Hanks program, uh, uh, reading Tim McMillan. Uh, he and I had a little interaction on uh, Twitter before I was part of the thing. And uh, I just knew these were my type of people. And uh, seven, eight days after they launched, they put the word out they were looking for writers. And I uh, got on my uh, scooter. I drove up to Winnipeg, Canada, knocked on MJ's door. <laughs> And said, MJ Benias, hire me. I will write for very cheap. And uh, other than, everything other than the scooter part of that story is true. So. <laughs> That's, amazing. That, that's fantastic. Um, and so, Chris, you know, obviously you and I um, worked together quite a bit while I was at the debrief. And um, you guys, I mean, what a special chemistry the entire group has. Where do you see, I mean, is this something that you guys want to keep as like a, a tight group and then you want to like build it into something bigger or like what, what's the direction of the debrief and where do you see, where do you see this train headed? Maybe, maybe start with you there, Micah. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and first let me just acknowledge, you know, Mike Mataluni, uh, once you've been part of team, uh, debrief Goonies, you, you're always part of the family. So, I mean, you're, you're alumni brother and, uh, there's no better place in light of that, uh, then right here, I really think in terms of celebrating this anniversary. And let me also note, it. like Chris was talking about, was that Chris or Chris or was it MJ? He's, he had glasses on a moment ago. It's I'm me, Jazz Shop. You look, oh, I see. I I'm, sure, I'm sure if we merge them all together, it'll be just as a fun acronym as the two offices that just came out of the Pentagon. Exactly. <laughs> we can come up with something like that. We can, you know, and here's the thing. If you tried to merge those three names, uh, whether it was the actual full name or the abbreviation, it would still be more pronounceable than the current DOD UAP investigative group. We'll have plenty to say about that in a minute. Let me let me jump back in time yet again, though, because being a history guy, I, I love to talk about what happened before the debrief. And we should point out that, you know, like Chris was saying, you know, Tim's groundbreaking reporting for a number of national publications. MJ Benias was doing that. Those two were even teaming up together from time to time. I was working as a writer and a journalist and, of course, you know, podcasting. And as I've continued to do with my own podcast, you know, report on these kinds of developments uh, coming out of government with regard to UAP and a whole host of other things that we now cover at the debrief on my own shows. So, I mean, we all were covering different areas of media it's not like really the debrief was anything different from what we had been doing, but what led us to want to kind of kick that off and get things rolling was a couple of fundamental realizations. And again, when you look at the history of a topic like UAP, you'll quickly see that there are these kind of growth spurts that occur. There are periods of you know incredible, I would say very intense interest that are followed by these kind of you know drop-offs. And after the ODNI report that was issued to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence back in June by the UAP task force, uh, we saw a little of that. A lot of people were obviously waiting for this report. There was a tremendous buzz. You guys well know that. Uh, once the report appears, 
you know, op opinions on this were mixed and varied. Tim and I, of course, teamed up and did an article that very day that provided analysis. Thereafter, I mean, within just a couple of days, Tim had already done a complete breakdown. You know, I did another analysis in the newsletter the week that followed. And a lot of people, instead of really trying to pick it apart and comb through the details as we were trying to do with the debrief, uh, were kind of looking at this and going, well, we expected there'd be a lot more. Where's the triangle photograph we've been hearing about, you know? And you did see a bit of a drop off. That's not the first time this has happened. And in fact, going into starting the debrief with all the range of topics we wanted to cover with regard to that one, UAP, we knew and we had discussed many times, there is an eventual uh, drop off that we can probably expect when that occurs. And when the media doesn't want to keep talking about these incredibly significant issues, we want to be that platform that will continue to report on it responsibly. We will continue to bring updates and news that breaks even when, you know, the mainstream media isn't paying attention to this. And so we've kind of placed ourselves as outliers in the sense that we're willing to cover those topics even when the mainstream won't, even when the mainstream has lost interest and they're not getting all the clicks that they're hoping for. <clears throat> And furthermore, we're going to try and do that in a way that brings you a deeper analysis. It's not just rush to get it out. Often what you get from us is sometimes for days and even weeks after the fact, more and more analysis that gives you a deeper perspective on the news that already broke. That's fantastic. Um, Tim, you want to add anything to that? No. Well, what was the original question? Uh, you know, where are we going? Uh, I think, you know... <laughs> A lot of places, Mike, you know, you know me from behind the scenes well enough to know that uh, and all the guys know that I um, I definitely and, and admittedly have a conqueror's mentality. And so, you know, we want to grow this thing. That's why we've never stuck to one thing. I think when Micah first said, hey, you know, let's do exactly what he just described with just UAP. And I'm like, no, screw that. Let's take it all on. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, we see that. In, in what we're putting out. And most importantly, I'd like to think that we're, we are doing a public service, not just in what we cover with UAP, but everything. Uh, you know, the world's a crazy place <laughs> the last couple of years uh, between COVID, politics. It's been a crazy time. And, you know, anytime anything feels broken, and in this instance, the world, people start looking for something new, something exciting. And, and that's actually, you know, everybody's afraid the world's going to come to a cataclysmic end. It's kind of the opposite. You know, if you look at history, actually, that's when people innovate. That's when people go land on Mars. That's when people come up with new propulsion. That's when they suddenly, unexpectedly decide they want to start looking at UFOs is because, you know, when everything around you seems chaotic, you want to believe there's something else. And we have this really, we as in human beings have this incredible ability to do some amazing things when we put our mind to it. And so for us kind of tapping into that cultural climate and realizing stuff like AI, virtual reality, there's going to be some really exponential disruptive kind of breakthroughs coming, you know, the next 10, 20 years is going to look dramatically different. You know, we may, uh, be doing this show 10 years from now, all with our VR sets looking like we're sitting around the campfire and, and, and not being able to distinguish that we're not physically there with each other. And so we, you know, I want to to try to drive the debrief to being that focal point where people know they can get a handle of what's coming on. So maybe the future seems more exciting than it does scary because the unknown in future likewise scares people. So that's, you know, where we're going to go. Um, we're going to keep drawing things and we'll be doing a year two show with you guys. We'll be doing a year three and uh, how big and great that is. We'll see, you know, hopefully it will be with Chris Plain pulling up in his limo, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Um, hopefully, actually, I think it'll be funny if Chris Plain is actually driving the limo and MJ Benias is uh, <laughs> cleaning it up in the back. That would actually be. It would I'm surprised we MJ in the limo. Uh, we, yeah, we don't let MJ in the middle. I, let me, okay, go for oh, it. Go ahead. Go. No, no, go ahead, Luis. No, I was going to say, as I mean, well, I guess as founders, um, you know, my I, my question would be is looking back at this year, what is sort of either your favorite or or the thing you're most proud of where you stand back and you go, wow, we did that. Cool. You know, like this is, uh, this is, this is really fun. This is different than anywhere else I've worked. And, and, and then, you know, I guess what excites you about that? Chris, Ryan you Sprague, had why don't you why don't you jump in there, Ryan Sprague? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> getting rid of Mike was a big step. You know, we we were at that point. We were three four months in, and you know when you feel an anchor 
dragging the whole operation down, right? You, can, you have that feeling, you look out, there's, there's something at the back of the boat dragging the whole thing down. And you figure that out, you cut that line, it's like you've been set free. So, uh, uh, no, you know, I, I just wanted to, to echo what, uh, what uh, Tim and Micah were saying. But I will tell you this. There's a lot of amazing stuff coming. The first year was a lot of a lot of getting our feet, figuring out our rhythm, figuring out our YouTube channel, figuring out a lot of those things. A lot of that stuff is still being worked on and improved and figured out. We have new content creators coming. We have new writers joining. It's really... We're getting ready to go to a whole new level here in year two. There's no doubt in my mind, especially without that dead weight dragon. <laughs> so, once you, once you pop that piece wrap it of useless up. flesh off your roll. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say he's uh, he's also dead weight with us. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what were we talking about, guys? <laughs> Oh man! Well, you know, like, coming back to that question and, and talking about some of the achievements of the last uh, you know twelve months again, and I'm sure Tim would echo the same sentiment. He and I both, I think, it took us by surprise that it was our anniversary because you know I mean we're we're managing a lot of things every day. I'm sure that there are some who might have this idea of oh you know they're writing articles and they're you know, interviewing people all the time. Yeah, that when you've got time, but then there's the, you know, the business management, there's, you know, the website stuff. I mean, there's so much going on behind the scenes. And so often those tasks, those other things that a small operation is kind of bogged down with, I mean, those take precedence. You get all that stuff done first and then you got the rest of the day to write if you're lucky. And so, yeah, it very much was a surprise that, you know, our, our uh, anniversary had kind of rolled up and looking back on the last 12 months, I'll tell you one big thing for me, uh, obviously being uh, very interested in UAP and obviously, you know, loving that subject, but also being interested in what's happening about it right now. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think has gotten so many people interested has been the fact that we now have a lot of scientists who are weighing in on this topic. Uh, we're seeing mainstream publications that have reported on this. And I take a lot of pride personally uh, in the fact that the debrief has actually showcased the work of some of those scientists, <coughs> of those reporters, on our own publication, I mean, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, two of the co-authors on the initial story that broke in 2017, they have been contributors here at the debrief. And also Harvard astronomer Avi Loeb, who has founded the Galileo Project. Avi, Avi, I think, has done, what, two pieces for us now. And to have a Harvard astronomer who's willing not only to look at the UAP issue, but also to write for our publication, really, um, it is humbling. And it is also, I think, an indication of where we hope to go with the range of topics that we're covering. And I can guarantee you there'll be plenty, you know, plenty more in the months ahead, the years ahead, in fact. But that's definitely been a huge takeaway for me, seeing how we went from completely bootstrapping on day one to now having some of the very names who have changed the debate with regard to that subject. It's, it's just incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's truly amazing. Tim, you had something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, yeah, Micah, Micah took probably one of my, my, you know, the biggest achievements this year was seeing that. Some of the people like Avi Loeb and uh, Ralph Blumenthal, people like that reaching out to us. And that lets you know that you're, you are achieving the goal you set out to achieve, which was be a credible outlet that, that people can turn to. And, and I think probably in year one, that moment when I'm like, yes, we did what we said, one of the goals that we set out to achieve uh, was very early on, you know, uh, I had been covering uh, UAP stuff for Popular Mechanics and Vice. Mike has been covering it for years on his show. MJ was covering it for Vice. And, uh, you know, I said when we started this out, you know, I want to cover this topic, but let's cover it legitimately, seriously, just like you would any other topic. And, and for me, you know, my, my kind of specialty is from that uh, government, national security kind of aspect, uh, that background. And I said, let's cover it just like it's any other national security topic. Uh, without all the little green men jokes and woo woo. And, and let's go after it. Same thing with sources, you name it. And uh, that's how we we kind of launched things. And then midway through the year, just before the, the ODNI report came out, uh, you know, I got a lot of calls and a lot of emails from people uh, that everyone would know in terms of major outlets, publications, uh, you know, very significant. Some of the, the significant news organizations that covered uh, the topic we're reaching out beforehand saying, Hey, we want to cover this now all of a sudden. And, or we're, we're preparing to do an entire special on this. 
uh, we need you. Can can you give us the rundown? <laughs> you know, they were coming to us and saying, look, we've been looking at your stuff. And, and can you kind of give it walk us through this? And so we very quickly for somebody at that point, we hadn't even been open a year yet to establish yourselves as the subject matter expert that the other news outlets are turning to. <laughs> you know, the major outlets for me, it was really impressive to see. I mean, some of these that have, uh, you know, broken very significant global news stories at times. And they're coming and saying, hey, so what's going on with this? Who's this person? Who's that person? What's your feeling on this? It, it, it was nice. It, it was good. It's one of those things that in the media world behind the scenes, you're not going to get credit for it. You're not always going to show up in the show credits, but that's okay. You know, that's okay. It, it was nice because if nothing else, during that brief spat of interest where it was popping, uh, you know, we, we were able to to hopefully add some extra credible information to what was being reported out there by other outs, not just what we were reporting. So I think that right. was when I was like, OK, we've arrived. <laughs> right. Now, that's incredibly important. And, if you, and you've done that in only a year. I mean, you got to think about how, what a short period of time that is that you've been able to. And they wouldn't be reaching out if the level of journalism wasn't there, if the research wasn't there. And, and you guys didn't you know, really build that up and, and take a lot of pride and uh, in it. Um, let me ask you this. OK, so here's one of the biggest challenges, I think, you know, when you see slow periods in in UAP news, um, you have a lot of folks who are always waiting for that next thing to break. And, and some people have been waiting for disclosure for 30 years, some for 50. Um, and there always seems to be something on the horizon, but there's never been a formal disclosure. And I think the fear is there never will be a formal disclosure. Is that something that you are concerned about? Or do you think that we should just be taking this one step at a time and not uh, not expect anything um, of, of that sort of, um, you know, of that sort of grandiosity from the government? Like, what do, what is y'all's take on that? Tim, you want to jump in first? I'll follow up. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that sentiment. And obviously, I see that a lot throughout the community and comments and, and comments to me personally and just in general. Um, and so I understand that. And you're right. People are waiting for it. Uh, I also maybe frustrate people because I say that's not what I'm waiting for, nor is that my goal to bring about disclosure, nor is that even on my, uh, you know, board, my, my wish board here of things that I'd like to see happen. Not because I don't think it would be really cool and exciting, but I think that when you put that as your goal of what is success or what is the end game here, um, you miss a lot in between. And, and again, going back, Luis has set me down the track. I'm a huge college football fan. So he mentioned football. And so the guys, the other guys, Chris and Michael, will tell you, I use lots of analogies. But, you know, nobody goes to a football game for the sole reason that their team's going to win. And, you know, obviously they want their team to win. And when they win, that's exciting. But it, that's a very brief moment of the game. <laughs> that's the end. Even if you win the Super Bowl. You hoist the trophy, yay, yay, yay. You get your, your overpriced T-shirt and hat, and then it's over. And then the season starts again, and it's all this cycle. No, no. All the fun, all the action, the expectation that you might win, all the incredible plays, all the things that you're going to be talking about for years to come actually go on during the game, during those 60 minutes. That's the play. And so I think for me personally, I've never focused on that quote, disclosure end goal, because you're going to miss all those plays. You're going to miss all the exciting action, all the things all that's on the, that make the highlight reel for years to come. And it's not going to become fun, you know, if that was the only reason you go into it. And so that's why it becomes very serious for people. And I think there's a lot of animosity at times, uh, because I think at the end of the day, if it was, if any of us had control over disclosure, it would have happened yesterday. It would have happened, you know, 50 years ago, this type of thing. Uh, but none of us do. And so we don't have control over that. And so we chip away at it. We report at it. We, we try to dig up as much as we can. But, uh, you know, I would say that that's never like my overarching goal. Do I wake up and go, oh, they haven't <laughs> rolled out the Roswell bodies yet? You know, no, but, it, you know, there's a lot of interesting and exciting and fun stuff that's going on before that, if that ever happens. Yeah. And in terms of interesting and fun things going on and important developments, I'm going to toss it to Chris here in just a second to touch on the aviation side of this, which is something I've looked at for a long time. But, you know, again, you know, Tim and I, in fact, the very first time Tim and I ever spoke on the telephone was like for an hour. And then we jumped on the microphone and did an episode of my show. And um, and I remember one of the most unique things about that, those initial conversations, let's just call it one conversation, both on and off the mic in a single uh, afternoon 
we barely talked about UAP, did we, Tim? I mean, we were talking yeah. about psychology. We were talking about it was mostly psychology. Tim, of course, you know, having a background in that, uh, you know, as far as his education, his professional background in law enforcement. Uh, but I actually intended to go to school for psychology and ended up, ended up pursuing media. So we both have a, a fundamental interest in uh, the psychological side of all this. And, uh, you know, when you look at UAP, I think that a couple of things to acknowledge uh, when it comes to the idea of disclosure is that, you know, that idea has kind of murky origins. I mean, there certainly was a lot of reporting on the idea that the government was covering up information, and that's always been an, a contention since the early days of this topic. We can go back to the 1950s and 60s and people like, you know, Donald Kehoe, uh, Jim and Coral Lorenzen and others, you know, they were very much of the mind that, hey, you know, the CIA may be the supreme architects of Blue Book. Uh, there may be other intelligence agencies who are collecting and maybe withholding information from government. Once we actually saw the Freedom of Information Act come into existence, uh, UFO researchers, a few of them at least, were quick to jump into the game and to try and start appealing to government through this new formal procedure and process that would allow citizens access to information. And again, I'll just point out, they still do that. That's an integral part of how we as journalists at the debrief operate and how we attempt to appeal to government for information about this topic even today. But when UFO researchers first began to do that, we certainly did begin to find, I think that Dr. Bruce Maccabee, through his appeals to the FBI, had painted something along the lines of 900 pages of documents that they kept on UFOs. Now, where was the smoking gun? Was there evidence of the Roswell crash at New Mexico? There was an actual document about it that the FBI had. It was, whoa, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them not to call me in the middle of the interviews, and they do it the anyway. President. <laughs> I know, right? No. That was disclosure. We missed it. Yeah, we missed it. We missed it. We just hung up on disclosure. disclosure. Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone may have actually been a congressman or a senator uh, or their office, uh, you know, because this is, of course, a story that we're following right now at the debrief, too. <laughs> I'm sure. We won't call back in the middle of the interview. But um, again, the idea that documents have shown uh, an interest or rather the agencies and their documents show that they've had an interest in this topic. That's something that's certainly been known for a while. There was one page on the Roswell crash at, at uh, uh, well, Roswell, New Mexico, that the FBI had one page. Uh, but, you know, that's a story for another time. The more important fact, I think, is that as we begin to see what some of the documentation kept by intelligence agencies actually constituted, it became more and more apparent that they collected information, but what they were releasing was not significantly uh, representative of some sort of an extraterrestrial reality. If anything, at times, the intelligence agencies were seeming to convey, well, we, we're not sure what this is or if there's anything to it, but we're worried that, you know, Russia might use it to exploit communications channels, you know, to cause some sort of, you know, misinformation campaign to clog communications in advance of an attack. So, again, there was an, a, a concerted effort to collect information about both the topic, but more importantly, people who were looking at it out of concern that it might be something that the enemy, I mean, again, Earth-based enemies might use against us. So in terms of disclosure, while appeals to government on information it may have on this topic continue, and no doubt they certainly probably have some things that they haven't released to the public. In fact, we know that much. Uh, the question of what that is, I think, coming back to psychology is important because you have to recognize there's what people expect, what they hope for, what they want to see, and then there's the reality. And I've always said, and again, this kind of coming back to Tim's point, if you go in search of what you expect to find, when you get the reality, when the truth is revealed, if it's not what you hoped for, I think what you see is people's, like what we saw with people's reaction to the ODNI report in June. Is that all there is? We expected more. Well, of course you expected more, but that's the difference between the disclosure you hoped for and the disclosure you actually get. Now, what really interests me is how we have begun to see aviation professionals, scientists, you know, congressmen and women getting involved. Chris Plain did some excellent reporting on the aviation community, professional aviation community, and how they are now responding to the UAP issue, which has, to me, been a landmark. Chris, you want to talk about that? No, what a setup. Really. Just just yeah. tossed it right to him yeah. on a no, tee. Not really, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, all right. You know, well, maybe Chris Wayne wants to, want to talk about, about it. I'm not here's what I want to talk about. All right. First of all, quit turning my microphone off. That was you Chris. Got, it's not my, listen, listen. That was Chris. That your, your room has a very strange ambient sound. I don't know oh, what's going it? on. It sounds like a fan or something is going on in there. So that's why I've, I've been oh, just muting okay. it to get better sound. Don't take oh, it personally. It's totally quiet in here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. You know. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> here's what I want to hear about. We got Tim and Micah here for like 25 more minutes before they got to go, right? You're going to have me for the whole second half of the show. So I'll go on and on about that. I want their take on the Gillibrand Amendment and then, uh, and on the, 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 the office out of the DOD. And, and which one should we be rooting for? Should we be rooting for both of them, neither of them? I, I, I'm dying to know here. And I, I talk to these guys at work all the time, but as they pointed out, we're talking about work. We, we talk about what we have to do, not what we want to talk about. So I'm mm. dying to know these two guys' take uh, on that. And then in the second hour, uh, I'll drone on about the AIAA plenty. All right, Tim. <laughs> Tim, he wins. He wins. That was a much better handoff than either of you, uh, either of us did. I mean, he, he wins. I got to hand it to him. Good job, Chris. <laughs> and just for just for further context, so you actually and so Lou Elizondo came out um, and was uh, was disappointed in the uh, I believe it's the AOIMS. AOIMSG. Um and, uh, and and I saw Tim. You had you had similar concerns. Do you want to you want to tee us up for that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> kind of funny you know i think uh, i i guess concerns as much as this we, we talk about not having expectations but this is what i kind of expected and uh you know people are wondering what's going on like why have you got now you've got this really broad robust amendment but then you've got the government you know the dod coming out of the blue with this other you know really watered down kind of expectation what they're going to achieve and people are like what the hell's going on is it the cover-up is it the you know whatever no it's 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 the government. <laughs> the government is happening. And, and you've heard me probably say this both on Twitter. Or, and I may have said it last time I was on your show is people are getting a crash course in how the government actually works. And uh, it, it's not pretty. <laughs> and, and I hate saying that. But and I think to to some degree, you know, the UFO community, some of the some of the more well-known researchers or authors at times have, have done a bit of a disservice because they've given this picture that the government is capable of this coordinated effort in anything. Uh, and that's not really the case. Uh, probably one of the best examples to give you an, an idea of what's going on here. And I talked to this a little bit about with the guys and, and girl Chrissy last night. Um, you know, did anybody read the psychology today article that was published? Was it yesterday or the day before? Micah did. I don't think <laughs> I did. Where was me? where was it published? Psychology, Psychology Today. Okay, then how no, did I that didn't miss read it. it. No, yeah, I, how did, I, I didn't. God. I missed. That okay, one. well there you go. UFO Twitter, you're you're dropping the ball. There was a exceptional article done uh, in you in Psychology Today uh, about UAP and, and what it could mean in terms of new science and everything. Uh, the author of that article was Dr. Eric Hasseltine. Dr. Hasseltine is a brilliant man. He, he once headed up uh, Din Disney's Imagineering, uh, and then he was the chief science and technology officer for the Office of Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. Uh, he was essentially the chief technology officer for the entire intelligence community. So very brilliant guy for a long time. And he wrote a great article there, but he also wrote a great book a couple of years ago. And I loved it. Now, let me be wrong. It's kind of right up in my alley. Uh, it may get too technical for some people, but it's called uh, The Spy in Moscow Station. And it tells this fantastic story. And if you want to understand how the government works, it's a great insight into how it works. And the short of the long there is this is a very true, real story of events that happened. In 1978, the, the NSA uh, discovered a uh, Soviet bug inside the embassy in Moscow. OK, when I say discovered it, they found it, they removed it, they physically had it. It was an RF receiver hidden in a chimney inside the embassy. Um, they said that the, the Soviets are listening to all of your communications. They told the CIA this and the State Department. And in fact, uh, the CIA had had uh, Russian agents killed during this time because of it. And the CIA and the State Department said, we don't believe you. Hmm. <laughs> and they had it. In front of them, like they could have showed it to them. Eh, no, we don't believe you. And the NSA pushed it and it was this big turf war. And I'm not going to get in the weeds of this book, but you really get an idea of how it works where you're like, why are they fighting this? Like, it's, isn't everybody supposed to be on the same team? Like, why is there this resistance here into this idea that the Russians are spying on us? And the CIA was adamant about it. And the State Department was adamant about it to the point where they got a, a executive directive telling the NSA, stop mentioning it. Stop talking about it because, you know, 
we don't want people, we don't believe you. And this went on for five years until the NSA was eventually, by uh, order of President Reagan, allowed to go in, remove a lot of the property that was in the embassy, found the bugs, discovered and said, <laughs> they've been listening to you this whole time. So for five years, from the point they found it, and for five years, all right? Wow. And there was so much resistance to this and so much craziness. And even at a point when the NSA had difficulty finding these bugs, they, they actually thought that uh, this, maybe the CIA removed them so that they wouldn't find them to cause friction. In fact, when the NSA technician went to do the inventory, the CIA tried to get him drunk and, and had Russian prostitutes because they wanted to know what he was doing there because it was so compartmentalized. They, they, it was that point a code word option where only the NSA knew. Now, picture that in perspective to UAP, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Picture that in perspective that now, you know, adversaries spying on you is a real thing. They all know that's a real thing. It goes on. We spy on other countries. They spy on us. But imagine the resistance to the idea that the Russians or the Soviet Union was spying inside the embassy when you had the proof and evidence. So the U.S. government is a sprawling complex. And now what you're seeing is that the UAP subject is not going to go away, per se. And they're kind of acknowledging it. So you're going to see a lot of infighting here, as in who controls the topic. And, and you, you that's one of the things in that whole... Uh, that caused so much friction between the CIA and NSA is whose job is it? You know, they all say, well, NSA is their job isn't security. So screw them. And it's like, yeah, but this is going on. And so you're going to see this now and you're going to see this now with this idea. OK, well, fine. If you're going to make if, if you're if you're not going to let this go away and somebody's going to look at it, well, then it's our job. But then you're going to have other agencies that are like, no, this is my job. And others are going to say it's my job because at the end of the day, nobody wants to get embarrassed. <laughs> and say, oh, yes, this is really something uh, it, when it when it could when technically it should have been their job. And if nothing else, I think probably one of the most fascinating things for me, and maybe it's not as frustrating because it's fascinating to me to watch this process <laughs> is I can't think of a more complex problem to watch a government have to solve and especially mm. one like the U.S. government. Because it's everything is so segmented and compartmentalized where different agencies fall under different branches. They have different jobs. But you look at the UAP subject. That is something that is government wide. And it is a mysterious problem that, frankly, the U.S. government is not equipped to handle. And so it's interesting to watch how are they going to handle that. Because the DOD, I think a lot of people, when they saw that, I'm not going to attempt the acronym. I, I've forgotten from memory. I don't want it. Uh, you know, they, they cried foul that it, they were only going to look into military ranges and ranges under military control. Well, that's because by federal law, the Department of Defense only has limited power. They don't have the power to operate on U.S. soil, except under very, very strict circumstances. So they don't have authority. So then goes into, well, some of this authority bleeds into the Coast Guard. Some of this bleeds into the FAA. Some of this bleeds into Homeland Security. Some of this bleeds into the FBI. All everyone I just named all fall under different executive branches. So when the, the secretary of defense can't tell the FBI what to do, can't tell the FAA what to do. Likewise, none of them can tell. But to comprehensively look at that, you've got to get all of these agencies that aren't equipped to look at it. They, they don't work together as is. And in, in many instances, they work against each other. <laughs> They're in competition with each other. But they've got to work together to try to solve that. Now, tackle on the fact that every taboo that you can think of in, in anything, any conversation that you've had about the subject with anybody who's not from the UFO community, maybe they've just seen the, the New York Times article or something, or, or they've read an excellent and informative piece on the debrief, uh, and you're trying to explain it to them, and, and they're, they're like, oh, that's BS. Those, that's, now imagine the government. Just multiply that. So you're going to have people that are like, this is BS. The infighting and squabbling, and even if, let's say, the, the Gillibrand Amendment passes, um, who, what office is going to take that authority it is something to really look at. But I did. I, I said that, you know, w when I said my concerns, it was more of a people are about to get a crash course into this UFO problem. And then because of how robust, how, how structured that amendment was, 
um, it, it wouldn't shock me to see not just the DOD, but you're going to see all these other people be like, oh, well, hell, well, we're starting one too because we're not going to be outdone. And everybody's going to try to muscle in this and it's going to end up in this really interesting dynamic where a year ago people were upset because the government wasn't taking the topic seriously at all. Hmm. Now, fast forward, we're upset because there's too many people saying they're going to look into it. <laughs> well, here, here's here's my question on that, though. And, and I think the reason, at least lately, the reason why people got upset is because there seemed to have been a message coming primarily from Lou saying this AI MSG office is undercutting and undermining the Gillibrand Amendment. And you also compared it to, um, you said in a tweet that it's administrative terrorism. Um, and so people heard that and they're like, what's going on? And then when you <laughs> dig deep into it, when you just simply dig into it, you find out that, oh, wait a second, the DOD has no jurisdiction over this, this mm -hmm. bill. So if this bill becomes law, they really can't do anything. And it seems by the statement by Kathleen Hicks that this office that the DOD is creating, they're doing it without anyone's permission. They're doing it just because they can't. Um, and I think you're sort of this idea of, well, they're not going to be the only ones who look at this. We're going to look at it, too. Um, and so I guess my question is, why is this administrative terrorism if this office really can't do anything to if this law passes, if the Jill Amendment goes through, which maybe we find out tonight if it could have happened already as we were on the show. Um, but if that could you explain a little bit as to why that's sort of the feeling with with this new office because six months ago we would have been all aboard for this we would have been absolutely filled with an office like this and um and it seems like for me more data is more data i don't care where i'm getting it from if we're going to get more data from different sections of the government great maybe we could paint a better picture with that data um or we could get at least a little bit more clarity for the american people as to what exactly we're dealing with here so um so yeah i mean can you touch on that a little bit sure yeah yeah no I, and, and i i <laughs> It's one of those things where I said it and didn't realize after and, until I said it. That, uh, people <laughs> might not be Twitter familiar with the term. Free, yeah. 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 The, the term administrative terrorism and, and anybody that's worked in government, even at the local level, is very familiar with that term. We used it okay. all the time because administrative terrorism is just that. It's bureaucratic stuff that slows things down. You know, you're getting ready to, to run out the door to go to the mall and somebody says, wait, 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 wait. We got to inventory all of your clothes. And you're like, what the? This is administrative <laughs> terrorism. And so mm. that term is, you know, anybody who's working in government has heard that term. In fact, used it frequently. So, so please don't take anything away from that. Is that being, uh, I guess, analogous with terrorism? <laughs> right, at right. Writ. Yeah, but uh, but I mean, it does you know, make what, it sound as if though you know, like like this is a bad thing. This office is not good for the topic, and at least that's the way it seemed. It seemed like that was, the, and that's why. Mm -hmm. UFO Twitter sort of rallied around, like letting their senators know, hey, this office isn't good enough. Like we need more. We want the Gillibrand Amendment to make sure that that passes into, into the new NDAA. Um, but it, it's, you know, you know what I'm saying? I just, I think part of, there's, there's a part of a little bit of fear here that want to <laughs> But like I want to be used to construct a narrative or a message. Like and that was going to be like a follow-up question in a second was, is there, is there anything with this amendment or with these new offices that you might see as like, as maybe not good for this topic? Is there anything that we're just not reading correctly or we're not deciphering properly? Is there anything in the language of the bill that maybe worries you that, hey, this is actually going to do worse for the topic, not better? Well, I think the biggest concern, and I think that's what Lou Elizondo, I haven't read everything he said or listened to it, but I think yeah. that uh, when he, he was upset about it is because he's been in that system and understands kind of what's going on. And, and the other thing is that it, it is, it, everyone is correct in saying that the release of that information uh, very much was, <laughs> it, it had a lot to do with the Gillibrand Amendment, you know, the timing of it and everything. I think everybody could recognize that even though Kathleen Hicks had said, we're going to do this. Uh, you know, I believe the timeline initially was six months and it's been five months and they come out with it. The government does nothing early. <laughs> okay, They do right. nothing, nothing. So you think early. it was, a, you think the ODNI, this was a direct response to the introduction of the Gillibrand amendment. 
Sure. I think that the phone calls, phones started ringing when that went out it hit the airways and everything. Uh, people were saying, hey, what are we doing with our stuff? What are we doing with our stuff? We don't want to get caught with our pants down. What are we doing? In addition to the fact that you've got the uh, Office of the Inspector General digging into it, too. So there's a lot of CYA going on. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are trying mm -hmm. to cover their ass and, and they're trying to say, you know, again, like I mentioned, nobody wants to get caught with their pants down. Where right. They haven't been doing everything. So the idea that ODNI is going to take over this massive office and have all this jurisdiction and then prove all these things that the DOD hasn't been doing well does not sit well with the DOD. So they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. If nothing else, we need to know what's going on within our jurisdictional bounds uh, so that we don't look like a bunch of clowns here or, you know, with no answers if this other agency has answers. Now, one of the beyond concerns, that, Tim, I, do you beyond that, Tim, do you think there's actual information that they're they're trying to get a handle on and bury prior to the Gillibrand Amendment? Do you think that's a possibility or are we really just talking about, hey, we're just trying to cover our asses here? It, it really depends on what the executive offices think. Now, I can say that if it was going out of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence Office, which is uh, Lou Elizondo's former office, I think you've seen the pushback that he's offered. I think he, he is a good indication of how he feels they view the topic and how their uh, reports, their analysis and, and going into it. it. You know, going back to something uh, Micah said earlier, if you you know go with this expectation of what you're going to find, you often find it. And so... The, the expectation of that office, by all accounts, from everyone that, that I've spoken to, uh, is that they want to find BS, that this is not something that they need to be exerting time, effort and money on. And so therefore, uh, the idea that that's going to be their outcome, it could be very highly likely because that's mm. what that, you know, they don't. I think the Department of Defense at large has really made it abundantly clear, uh, not direct statements because they don't like talking about it, that they don't want to talk about this. They don't want to deal with right. this. Whereas some other agencies do, uh, you know, ODNI has, has taken the lead. The Navy has taken the lead. So one of the concerns there is when in having these fragmentations. So you, you see that uh, the DOD has their UAP office. Well, ODNI is like, screw it. We're still going for it. And Space Force says, <laughs> hold my beer. Uh, I think the Army... <laughs> The army is my favorite because the army is is like, and I come from a big army family, so I can say it's like everybody I know from the army. It's just like, hey man, if we're going to strip club, and you're driving, I'm down. You know, like they're don't matter to me, man. Uh, but the problem is there that, is that each one of those compartments will control their information, and then the topic of UAP, you, you won't have this centralized focal point office. Instead, you'll have. Uh, you know, a pilot had a sighting and reported it to the Navy office uh, or the ODNI office. And they're, well, do we have any satellite data? Well, we've got to go to talk to uh, Geospatial or the NRO or the NSA to try to get uh, SIGINT or electronic intelligence on it. And then those agencies don't necessarily always hand over <laughs> what they have. <laughs> Quite frankly, they often don't. And so you, it's this idea that uh, who has is there going to be a central office that has the authority, power and muscle to really use all of the resources the United States government has behind it? Because whenever we do put all those resources, whether it's terrorism or fighting wars, uh, they tend to be pretty successful and they have a lot at their disposal. But the problem is these things are not centralized and they're not under one umbrella authority outside of the president. You need the president. You know, if, if the president would step forward and say, no, damn it. Just same example I gave you at the NSA CIA with the Moscow thing. It took the president of the United States to tell the NSA, no, go do this. And I don't care what they say. So I think that's part of the concern is that if you've got a ODNI office, you've got a DOD office and, and you've got these other offices is that they will each be examining the topic from whatever is within their purview. And when right. One doesn't share with the other, then it's never it's, you're going to have MUFON and all these other things. You're going to have these competing. It's going to turn into UFO Twitter in the government. <laughs> mm. oh, oh, that got sounds it. terrible. Micah, yeah. <laughs> well, so you have got I've got 17 seconds left. So oh, I'm kidding. Uh, in fact, we're going to have to roll over all, uh, into the top of the hour because, uh, yeah, I have plenty to say. And again, Tim really has kind of given us, you know, the the the, the full scope of the issues that government is facing right now to an extent, you know, I've got to kind of sympathize with uh, any element within the government, or if we even want to refer broadly to the military, having to be tasked with 
trying to resolve an issue that, let's face it, they've been looking at for more than half a century and haven't been able to resolve. When we talk about how, as Tim mentioned, some agencies seem to be more willing to chime in on this and more willing to weigh in on the topic like the Navy has been, uh, whether that is necessarily by choice or it is by uh, virtue of the fact that other agencies simply won't, the Air Force dealt with this in the longest running systematic military study by the U.S. government, Project Blue Book, between the 1950s, early 50s, and 1969. And they remained stone silent uh, at every opportunity uh, for, for decades thereafter, with a couple of notable exceptions after the closure of P Project Blue Book. Uh, again, at the request of congressmen and women back in the 1990s, because there was a lot of public interest in the Roswell crash at New Mexico, uh, and this in part due to books that were being published on it, television shows like Unsolved Mysteries that were kind of reinvigorating the debate. A lot of people were like, what's really going on here? And so the Air Force kind of had to get back into the game there for a time. They produced a couple of official documents documents and did their own investigations, which offered not one, but several, you know, different explanations for parts of the Roswell mystery, um, which raised a lot of questions for people. One being, okay, well, which version is the definitive narrative? Because they had said that everything from crash test dummies to charred bodies in an airplane crash to um, Project Mogul and, you know, high altitude balloons that were used during the Cold War. I mean, a range of different things put together over several years constituted the, what was remembered or misremembered as the Roswell event. The reason that that's important is because people look at that and they go, well, first of all, which is the narrative or how can we take this seriously given that we first heard, of course, that it was a flying disc, then it was a weather balloon. Then they say it was a mogul balloon. We know that they had lied several times. So how do we know they're telling the truth now? Now, in my opinion, having reviewed Roswell, um, you know, again, I, like a lot of UFO researchers, have become less and less enchanted with that case as time goes on, because if you really look at it, again, I refer back to the FBI single page document on that. It was actually from, I believe, let's see, let's refer to the newspapers. I keep them right here so I can look at all this, right? July 8th, 1947. I believe that on the same date, the FBI document said it appears that a high altitude uh, balloon was recovered. They were reporting that in the FBI's document a day before it appears in the other newspapers. And it's actually stated we had a weather balloon in our possession. So it seemed the FBI already had been tipped off. And again, the historical documents seem to pretty clearly show there probably wasn't as much to Roswell as it once had been thought. But again, it's an interesting point to look at in terms of history and what it takes to get an agency like the Air Force back into the game. It's no wonder they don't want to have to deal with this right now. And people say, where's the Air Force been? Why is the Navy doing this? The Air Force never wanted to have to get back into this game. And here again, I do sympathize with almost any element within government who is tasked with having to do what the Air Force tried for almost two decades to do and weren't able to, to achieve. And so the thing about, you know, bringing this around to the Gillibrand Amendment, you know, I'm not particularly surprised by what has been outlined with the new AOIMSG. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll just refrain from further jokes about the name, but almost everybody, Tim Burchett in Congress actually got up and made a statement about this recently. And even he said, I don't know where they got that name from, but everybody's joking about this name, you know. My theory would be that it may be intentionally unpronounceable and, and obviously forgettable with the hope that people won't be able to pronounce it. People won't remember it and they won't focus on it and worry about what they're doing because they can't pronounce the name. They, you know, the UFO thing that they've got up there. But I wasn't really surprised by what it actually is, according to the DOD release from last Tuesday, what was outlined, because essentially all those points were in um, Kathleen Hicks' memorandum that coincided with the release of the ODNI report back on June 25th. You know, again, she's saying we are very concerned with these incursions in our military airspace. We want to try and, you know, be proactive with looking at these and dealing with these. We want to collect information about them. They never said, you know, we're going to look at everything that happens anywhere in the skies. And again, to Tim's earlier point, they're not able to. There are jurisdictional issues with their ability to even do that. And right. so something we have to take into consideration with all of this is that according to what Hicks outlined in her memorandum, if we look at the ODNI report delivered by the UAP task force, they state in the report, this is to guide future policy and future efforts on this issue. They seem to have done essentially exactly what they said that they would, but the surprise had been that, as Tim pointed out also, Congress, you know, again, Senator Gillibrand specifically, got into this a little bit earlier, outlined a much more comprehensive plan, one that would be both more costly and likely would have to require on the assets and abilities of many different agencies. 
again, this would be a much more elaborate plan. And I think that the DOD looking at this, this is pure speculation on my part, but it's very much in line with what my colleague has said here. They're seeing this and they're going, whoa, 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 hold on. Let's hit this off at the pass because we don't want to have to mess with anything as elaborate as what they're proposing in this amendment. And so they launched this investigative agency. And it's interesting now to see how those who have co-sponsored the proposed amendment to the uh, Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022 are responding to this. You know, Gillibrand has spoken about it, but she's been a bit, um, let's say that she's been a bit vague. Uh, Marco Rubio issued a statement to Air Force Magazine. and He had said, look, you know, I support the government in looking into these aerial incursions and these mystery objects. So, I think that the sense, at least from what I'm getting among, you know, members in Congress right now is that this may not be what we wanted. If this is what we get, you know, we'll go with it. But obviously, Lou Elizondo and many others, and of course, UFO Twitter, they've expressed their concerns because, no, this wouldn't be the comprehensive plan that's outlined in the Gillibrand Amendment. Uh, This is going to be very limited in scope. We don't have any assurance that there will be, again, annual reports delivered to Congress, uh, semi-annual reporting updates. And again, will the public have any information provided? Now, strange and paradoxical, though it may sound, there's a part of me that hopes that whatever comes of all this, we won't be handed all the answers. Because, again, at the end of the day, we talk about this all the time at the debrief. We got into this because it's a fun topic. We do want to know the truth. I think we can handle the truth. But I doubt the government has all the answers. And a part of me still enjoys the quest. I enjoy (laughs) the process of looking into this and trying to understand what it's all about and hopefully applying science toward it. So it's anybody's guess where it'll go from here. And we may find out within a few hours. But again, I'm not surprised. And I certainly hope that there are going to be a few surprises on down the road, maybe (laughs) that civilians will still be privy to. I think you guys make it such an important point, and I think this is so critical. And Luis and I have been talking about this for for months now, is how critical it is that we don't attach our identities to a specific belief system or outcome when it comes to UAP. I think that's one of the things that causes so much harm, whether it's psychological um, or you know sociological harm when it comes to this topic, because – If you do, if the outcome is so important to you, a a specific outcome is so important to you, when faced with an alternate reality, then you're you're subject to anxiety, depression, all of these things. And I think it's so dangerous, really, when it comes to and especially and and Tim, you brought this up earlier. And I think it was such a such an important point that, you know, when society is in struggle, when 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 the world is unknown, when outcomes are ambiguous, it's very easy to put your all your hopes and your faith and your energy and passion into one basket. And I think you guys represent this topic in a very, with a lot of journalistic integrity, you represent it in a way that really focuses on, you know, let's, let's have at this, right? Let's, let's pick, let's pick away what is truth and what is fiction in order to get to the truth, because no one's preconceived notion, no one's self-fulfilling prophecy is going to be spot on. And it's so critical that we don't allow ourselves to personally, as individuals, you know, go into spirals of anxiety or depression or violence even (laughs) over topics like this. Sure. And I think, you know, I've had these discussions with uh, people who've worked on the programs, um, you know, in the contemporary program. So the the task force, that kind of stuff, or or people who have worked with them uh, in different capacities whose names aren't out there. Uh, but one of the big questions I had, and Micah brought this up, that the first time we ever met and chatted, we, we talked about psychology and because and, uh, that's really where kind of my bread and butter is in cognitive psychology. And I asked them, I said, you know, how much effort has been gone? How much effort has been put into this idea of how certain are we that we could perceive correctly something that is, uh, you know, inherently alien? Right. And I say alien, not just as not from this planet. I mean, something totally anomalous, totally abstract. And there's no guarantees there. And I think that this idea that uh, we could have it right is actually probably pretty wrong because we can only draw on what knowledge and information that we have available to us. You know, what we can read in a book, what we've been told. We can all imagine a dragon because we've seen movies by it. We've had them described to us. But but something that is just totally you know outside of a you know, total anomalous discovery. What is the expectation that we could perceive that correctly? And I don't you know there isn't any you know if we don't have the language to describe something, you're not going to be able to describe it. And so 
that's an interesting aspect of all of this because we it is such a fleeting topic where I, mean, I think you know that would be one of the uh cornerstone tenets of this topic is it's always just a little bit you know maybe it's a fleeting glance of something or it's you know, a very intense experience but it's not captured on video or audio and all these different things so it's never this full picture of what we define as being true factual uh, or just ground truth reality and so, you know, what does that mean about it? I don't know, other than perhaps there is aspects of this. It's very difficult for us because we don't, <laughs> we can't perceive what's going on. And so mm -hmm. to, to your point, Mike, absolutely. You know, there, there is this idea that if we encounter anything truly anomalous, uh, we're not going to have the, the knowledge base uh, existing. We're all going to be done in Kruger here. You know, we're going to believe that it's something, but, uh, there's nothing that says this what it is. So yeah, if you put all your eggs in, in one basket, um, you're right. It, it can cause a lot of distress, both on yourself emotionally, psychologically, and just in general. Uh, and so part of that fun uh, of long as there's an unknown, it can be anything. And so that's kind of fun, you know, <laughs> it is fun to me. And so let enjoy that aspect of it. Cause even if aliens flew in, there's really, we have nothing on our plate here that says we would see them, understand them, or even comprehend it because it would be alien. Right. <laughs> totally right. abstract. <laughs> right. Um, real quick, just I wanted to go back to what Senator Tim Burchett said yesterday on the floor. Um, just touch on it because he did kind of mock the name of this new office. But then he also, the, yeah, after you do that, Luis, we yeah, gotta let these guys go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, after, but then right after that, he wrote a letter. Uh, to um, Ronald S. Moultrie, the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, uh, basically thanking him for this new office, <laughs> and then, and, but also saying, um, you know, I'm I'm requesting that the AOI MSG uh, brief members of Congress on their findings in a classified setting, followed by a public hearing, which means we could, worst case scenario, maybe get some public hearings out of these offices. What do you think that would look like? <clears throat> And could we trust this office to provide the American people with, you know, would we get David Fravor and Alex Dietrich in a public setting like that from this office, do you think? I highly doubt it. I think when they're talking about public hearings, we would see uh, something consistent with what we see all the time with the public hearings, especially the national security public hearings where you have an agency, the, the, the head of whatever agency comes and briefs Congress publicly. And uh, they're oftentimes... Um, not all that informative. <laughs> you know, if anybody, anybody else is a nerd like me that watched the, the 2021 national threats uh, hearing where they have all the heads, the CIA, the NSA, OD&I is all there and they all brief what are the big threats. Uh, you know, one of the ones that obviously came up was COVID, you know, it's questioned, well, do we know where COVID came from? And uh, it's this, uh, well, we, you know, it could have been this, it could have been that. And so you very likely could see the exact same thing with, with UAP. You could see uh, the, the director of national intelligence sitting there telling Congress, yes, we what you read in that uh, report in June being said verbally. <laughs> you know, yes, we have this that the only nice thing, I guess, would be in these instances, you do have lawmakers that can ask questions. They can ask follow up questions. You know, Marco Rubio can stand up and demand is it aliens? You know, and, and some of these politicians do a, a really good job of uh, of grandstanding. So, you know, I think that's where the, the idea that people uh, I would say that the public has definitely had an impact when you see these lawmakers uh, talking about it as much as they have. Uh, so, yeah, you know, there's um, who, who's the co-sponsor from South Carolina? Why am I drawing a blank on it? Lindsey um, Graham? Lindsey Graham. Yeah, yeah. I mean, good gosh, he could get all sorts of animated. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever seen him in the confirmation hearing. So, yeah, who knows? Right. Old, right. Old he'll be up there screaming, jumping up and down. That'd be an interesting day. That's for sure. Um, I mean, just politically speaking, I would be so confused. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, oh, I like I like what he's saying, but God, I really don't like him. Uh, but yeah, that's... <laughs> If there's any positive, you know, if it's not disclosure, perhaps the best positive uh, outcome that can come from all of this news is people are actually paying attention to how the government operates and lawmakers operate and everything. And they they may go, this is stupid. 
Like how we, how do we get anything achieved? Like we, we've never, we haven't faced another attack because nobody's wanted to evidently, because how does anything get achieved? So if nothing else, hopefully maybe people pay attention to that and go, man, some things need to be changed here. Yeah. yeah. And if congressional hearings occur, let's just hope that it's not Congress asking Robert Mueller questions. Can you repeat the question? Right. Can you repeat right. the question? What was that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, I, I'll refer to the report, the language in the report. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that was sort of like a secondary goal. So the, of the phone home was just, hey, teaching people how to interact with their government is a good thing you know yes. how to find the representatives and you can take this formula and apply it to whatever activism you want and it works the same way yes so it's just you know, it's fun absolutely no i think that's great i think that's that's always been a, a big thing in mind that's how government's supposed to work it doesn't matter if we want the government to go look for unicorns if enough people in a democracy want them to look for unicorns well that's what they need to do then because <laughs> that's the way it's supposed to work so yeah, yeah. i definitely commend you guys for that well, man, um, we, we appreciate you guys. Yeah, we appreciate you guys so much. And uh, congratulations again on the one year anniversary of the debrief. Uh, if you are not following these guys, make sure you go to the debrief.org to check out the news magazine. And um, maybe you guys could tell us uh, quickly uh, where we could find you, Tim. Uh, if people want to find you on social media, if they want to find the debrief, uh, what's the best way to do that? Uh, at LT Tim McMillan uh, on Twitter. Uh, you can find me there. I go on my little Twitter spats where I'll be on there and call some <laughs> yeah, you can trouble, argue with people, and then I disappear for a couple of weeks. And... <laughs> you are the kind of like the Houdini of Twitter. <laughs> well, I just you know, and it and Micah's got a half-hearted grin there because he knows you know he's always like, oh god, what did Tim do? Tim's in a Twitter mood because I'll get on there and. <laughs> Rile up with Mike Turber or somebody like that. <laughs> <laughs> got flew on a Tic Tac. You gotta, you gotta talk to that guy, right? No, you have to. You have to. <laughs> Thank you. Tell yeah. Mike. <laughs> you you just to. gave him permission. You've yep. completely disrupted the debriefs yep. inner operations now, Luis. Well done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> I swear to God, every time it is an accident, it is not on purpose. <laughs> um, Tim, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, no, guys, go check out the debrief, and we'll talk to you again soon, Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thanks sir. so much, guys. All right, bye-bye. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Micah Hanks. If folks want to find you on social media, if they want to find the Micah Hanks program or the debrief, how do they do that? Yeah, well, if you want to find the debrief, it is the debrief.org, debrief media on Twitter, and it's usually debrief media on the various social media platforms. Definitely check it out. Again, keep in mind, we report on a whole lot more than just UAP, but even a lot of people who come there for that news have, you know, expressed to Tim and to me and to Chris and to uh, many of the other staff uh, there that, you know, you guys beautifully tie a lot of this stuff together you know whether it's defense developments like you know the hypersonic glide vehicle that was apparently tested by russia and it's missile uh, missile uh, deployment capabilities the pentagon looking at that and saying wow how did they get to that point and then like what days later they established this new uap investigative unit again we're saying that there may be a lot of things that may uh, be catalysts for what we're seeing happening with regard to the UAP topic. And again, we do sometimes look at tangent areas. So you're going to find a lot of that at the debrief. If you want to learn about me, just go to micahanks.com and you can find all the podcasts that I produce. I've got uh, four different podcasts that I'm doing right now, but the Micah Hanks program is the flagship. It goes out every week. Uh, Chris is going to be on there with me this week, along with Tim. We're going to do a bit of a debrief roundtable. Year end, where did we come from? How did we get here? And who the hell are all of you? <laughs> so it's going to be a lot of fun. Definitely check that out. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Micah Hanks. I've made it really easy. Everything's just my name. So you have, yeah. three pod you have four podcasts now? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had four podcasts for a while. You can find all those at MicahHanks.com, by the way. But yeah, I mean... There's the main show. I do a weekly uh, current events and news podcast called Metal Theory. Um, in fact, tonight I'm going to be taping an episode, hence why I got to run here in a moment, but uh, an episode of the Seven Ages Audio Journal, which is the archaeology show I do. And because of my passion for anthropology, I also have a show called Sasquatch Tracks, where we talk with actual scientists, field researchers, anthropologists, investigators, biologists about the possibility that a relic hominoid like Sasquatch could actually exist. So yeah, I, I stay pretty busy. And you oh know, God, there's been some it. discussion about a possible debrief uh, podcast in the in the year to follow. So, you know, I'm not going to get any less busy, am I, Chris Blaine? <laughs>
<laughs> amazing well thank you so much micah it's always a pleasure getting to spend time with you and uh i mean you 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 looking smoking hot in the uh the men in black uh get up so we appreciate it that's right yeah i didn't actually wear this just so i could look nice with you guys wearing your ties this is what i wear all the that's time your, yeah that's your that's uniform. your that's actually your pajamas yeah exactly <laughs> thanks, thanks for coming on micah thanks, appreciate thanks, it. Micah. Guys, thanks, i'm out micah. of here you'll have a great one and chris plain um I'm going to leave you to these gentlemen. You guys go easy on him, please. We'll Be try. kind to him. We'll try. Kind. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Later. Thanks, Micah. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd just like to thank both of those guys. It, it took a lot of uh, a lot of hustle on my part to get both of those guys to come on on the same show at the same time. And, and we appreciate uh, it, so Chris. I really appreciate Micah and Tim both showing up today. So uh, on a personal level, they did that as a favor to me. They're both big fans of you guys in the show. But just the timing, we are so busy right now at the debrief. We're at the one year anniversary and just so much is happening. So uh thanks guys for coming on. That was well, I didn't get to ask them because I know they probably wouldn't answer, but have you seen that triangle photo yet? Because I know you'd spill the beads. <laughs> you know what I told you, man. If you yeah. see it, you see it. All you right. <laughs> I see it. It goes out that day on Twitter. What is going on with my hair today? Jesus Christ. All right, while good. while you figure out your hair, let's uh let's bring on our <laughs> next panelist who's joining us today. Um this gentleman is a program planner in the defense industry. He has degrees in psychology with a focus on neuroscience and learning memory. He also has his MBA with a focus on international business. Ladies and gentlemen, Brooks Lopez. Welcome, Brooks. Hey everybody. How are you guys? What's up, Brooks? Uh, so Brooks is really excited to join us today because uh, you, Lou Schmelizondo, uh, yes. just wrote an article recently uh, for <laughs> the debrief. Man, we uh, tear up. We hold on a second. We taught him how to change his yeah. name on this on this software, and he's had fifteen names in one show. I've counted five just since I've been watching. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hey, you taught me how to do something new. I'm a comedian. What am I going to do? He's like man? a child. I can't I can't wrangle you. I'm going to have to put you on one of those leashes. <laughs> Turn it off my microphone. My God, it's horrible today. Oh, what is sorry, the, sorry, Brooks Lopez, the great sorry. work is the center of the Milwaukee Bucks. Well, what did no. Brooks Lopez want from me? Right, so, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm neither as tall nor as uh, wealthy as the or as good looking as the gentleman from Milwaukee. But... Uh, uh, no, I, I was very fascinated by the um, time flowing in both directions in the in the quantum realm article. I thought that was fascinating. Um, don't know how I feel about the uh, toothpaste analogy from the original authors, but that has none of your doing. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it was a really interesting study, and basically what they were looking at was, uh, you know, is time travel possible in the quantum realm? Right? Because uh, well, we it, know it in is, the, is in time the travel world, back in time, in the right? Day world, it's not something we see. What? So I was just going to say because we were, were uh, let's be specific here because there obviously time travel into the future is possible uh, if you travel sure. at the speed of light it is it is right. very possible, um, but you're talking about yes. right 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 yeah, and what you were talking possible. about sorry what <laughs> as close as, as possible, close as possible. Light, you'd still travel forward so yeah yeah Chris right. and I agree like, go ahead Mike sorry right no 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 it's totally fine I just <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that we're talking about time travel into the past yeah. in this specific article. So I wanted to get, um, you know, your take on, on the article, uh, Chris, Christopher Plain. Yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> I can tell you what I read and what I understood from the researchers involved was, um, basically, if you think of the, the constant time's arrow, the march of time, right, this forward movement of things that are happening, this conversation, anything, there's a basically... Uh, a movement, a constant movement towards entropy or disorder. Are you saying this interview is headed towards entropy, Christopher yes, Plain? Chaos. I, I think we went there about the point I cut you off the ship. Uh, <laughs> well, well, before or, the show when, uh, when Luis taught me how to change my name. So uh, yeah, way, that's where it happens. Hell, yes. um, so the idea was in looking at things in the quantum, things at that ultra tiny, ultra microscopic level, is there situation or circumstances where we, rather than moving towards entropy, that we move back towards order or essentially backwards to a previous state? And what they found was because of quantum superposition, the idea that you could physically be in two, a, a particle could physically be in two locations at the same time, the, then one of those could be moving towards the uh, normal flow of time and given the right set of circumstances, 
one of those could be moving backwards in time, something they observed at that level. And essentially, if if in the the the, the collapsing of the wave, as they like to say, the collapsing of the wave function, you become a reality forward motion. There are circumstances where it seems to occasionally go towards the backwards one. So occasionally mm. it moves back to a lesser form of entropy or to its previous state, essentially moving back in time. It's so almost like that was my idea understanding of, like, of what I read. Of what you read and wrote. Well, as I uh, tell people all the time, I'm not a PhD physicist. <laughs> I report on science. They hired me as a writer and a funny guy and a guy who's just smart enough to kind of get what these scientists are talking about and translate it for everyday people. So, yeah, that's that's what I'm trying to do here. Right. And I don't, it is I don't have a master's in anything like Brooks does. Right. Well, it is, it is fascinating this idea, because, and I think we've we've heard Lou Elizondo talk about this too when he's talking about like the the cigar analogy, how like as the cigar burns, like the where the cherry is, that like it's that that is time, and little bits will actually be ahead or behind depending on, and so you can almost imagine the superposition. From what I understand of the idea of superposition, is it's theoretically possible for the particle to exist in any state, but we don't. It's not as if it's simultaneously existing, and I could be mistaken there, but I do find it fascinating that they've discovered that it can be it can theoretically be moving back uh you know a, a small amount of time and if that's possible what else is possible and i think well, that's and that was one of the points i made in the article mike you know the idea was if this can happen at the quantum level at the quantum realm can it have an effect on the macro world on the everyday world we we live in can it can it translate can we take advantage of that somehow and actually move back in time. And one of the examples I used in that article is uh, a few months back, I wrote about how sharks uh, navigate the Earth's magnetic field like a GPS, actually using a quantum mechanics process. Something is going on, going on inside their brains at a quantum level that they are perceiving, interacting with, and reacting to to navigate. And there's a good feeling that birds who navigate the uh, 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 our, our magnetic field, Earth's right, magnetic field, birds. maybe doing it in the same way, maybe mm. uh, tapping in at the quantum level. There's a pretty good argument that consciousness is is occurring uh, in microtubules within the brain at a quantum level. There's some new research about that. So the idea that something happening at that level could translate, have an effect, or somehow even directly interact with the macro world already is happening. And as the scientists in that article pointed out, that research pointed it out, the whole world is occurring at the micro level. We're seeing the macro effects, but that quantum realm is all around us. So the idea that scientists have now spotted this, have said, okay, here's a place where we can actually see backwards movement in time. Can we somehow connect to that and, you know, build a Tartarus and go back in time? you know, build the, build the DeLorean, as I said in the story. And uh, that's the next big question for people that are a lot smarter than me to try and figure out. But uh, that was the question posed by the researchers. And uh, it was an ambiguous one. That's why I pointed out the article that they said, hey, this is not impossible to think that things occurring at the quantum realm could be taken advantage of in the real world. Hmm. Right. On the macro level. It's yep. true. I mean, it, it really is fascinating. Like even you were talking about things that are going on in the micro level and or the quantum level potentially in the brain. Um, there's research as well that speaks to that very thing going on, even with the sense of smell. Yep. Um, there's an article that came out recently about uh I can't remember the exact um details of the study, but they were saying that it's very difficult to to uh, interpret the sense of smell. Uh, on a purely chemical level, and they're starting to look into the quantum realm to to understand all the processes involved. It's fascinating. Yep. Yeah, total, totally insane. And uh, so are we around the corner from building a time machine? Absolutely not. But if science found a, a potential key to that concept, a, a potential mechanism that is real, that occurs, yeah, I think that's what we're seeing here. So uh, I think that's what was exciting about this study. So I think there's a couple of big things that go into this, uh, one of which is uh, really anything is in all positions at once until it's observed, right? That's one of the really important things that we have to you know, specify when we talk about quantum physics is 
the only time we know anything and anything has any real position, whether it's in time or in space, is once it's observed. Uh, this goes back to the whole Schrodinger's cat phenomena. A lot of people always do the is it living as a dead. It doesn't matter because it can be in any or all states until it's observed. Uh, that's the big thing, right? So if, if, if a particular particle is traveling in two different directions in time, it's going to be the observed one that takes that superposition. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a lottery ticket, Brooks, right? We buy a lottery yeah. ticket, we hold on to it. Until I check the numbers, I am both a winner and not yeah. a winner, right? Yeah. Like yeah, that's a great I analogy. Check, I'm walking around with this lottery ticket thinking I could be a billionaire right now. I could have. Mm. And that's the idea in science is that and, both situations occur until an observer. It's the old slit and uh, and uh, what am I thinking? The old uh, the quantum experiment. where Yeah, the Max Planck experiment with the yeah, photons the Planck, and the yeah, slit. Yeah, exactly. The dual slit experiment. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I think the other thing that we need to take into consideration, at least one of the things I took from the original article uh, the so the author, for those of you listening that aren't familiar with it, he uses an analogy of a tube of toothpaste. If you squeeze a ton of toothpaste out, there's no way you're getting it back into the tube. But if you squeeze just a little bit out and you let go, the decompression of the tube could pull some back in. I don't know how strongly I feel about that analogy, but that was the, the choice of the author in this case. But what I do take away from it is that even though a reverse time um, direction could be established for a particular particle, it's probably only for that specific observation between two superpositions rather than something that could be established in an ongoing and iterative process where you could go back several times. So I think that that's something that's worth discussing or thinking about you know, when we think time travel backwards, we're thinking about let's go way back rather than whatever the last instant was, right? Right. Yeah, rather than like a five second rule is what I put in the article. Yeah, and I like that. See, I think that makes five sense. Second rule. You've got like one redo, basically. You can take one jump back, and, and at least that's what they've shown. And possibly just for that single particle, too. Right. So right. Possibly exactly. Just, which is your point. Way to take the fun out of the discussion, by the way. That's what I do. You can That's ask right. Mike. No time travel, people. For. Just, you know, Mike and Tim came in here and said, we don't care about UFOs. Brooks doesn't care about time travel. That's today's <laughs> well, I've just given that? up all hope, you know. That's all it is. What was that one film that um, had a, a device that takes the. When they figured out what it did, it t only takes you back seven seconds, I think, in time. And they were trying to figure out, well, what's the purpose of that? Why seven seconds? And it was There's definitely so you a could Futurama episode. You could yeah, yeah, you could correct a mistake in seven seconds. Yeah. yeah. Um, or you can you can make a different choice in seven seconds. If you could go just back seven seconds in time, you can possibly really That's change. That's a new movie, isn't it? Or I, I think I it like, is. Yeah, I'm I feel like it's a what trailer. film that was. They definitely um, stole that from Futurama. The final episode of the series, uh, Professor Farnsworth has a button that goes back 10 seconds but it takes mm. 10 seconds to charge. So you can basically do it with just the, whatever the, the you know, entropy of the time it takes you to push the button will reduce the amount of time you can actually go back at a, you know, slowly degrading level. And so Fry basically is falling to his death infinitely because he keeps trying to get saved. It's a, it's really heartbreaking to watch, but uh, great. But I'm assuming that's what they stole for this movie. It was Galaxy Quest. Was that really? seven seconds? Yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, it Man, was Galaxy I gotta have to watch Quest. Galaxy Quest again. That's a great one. Oh my god. What it's a cast. I, I, somebody somebody had uh I read a quote that it's the best Star Trek movie that was it's never the made. second best Star Trek movie that was never made. <laughs> What's number one? <laughs> Wrath of Khan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wrath of Khan was number one. Uh, nice. but Galaxy Quest slaps. That movie is awesome. I just watched it. Actually, my girlfriend had never seen it. We watched it like a month ago. Oh, my wife I'm like, loves it. This movie still holds up, and you can easily remake this flick, uh, and it would still be awesome. Yeah, I hope oh, they don't remake awesome. it. That oh, I don't think it is, needs to. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. It's There's so no good. Alan Rickman anymore, man. Like, we can't... Was that the, was that the Tim Allen one with the robot yeah. with the yes. alien bugs? And it is phenomenal. It really. Were is. they going backwards awesome. in time? I don't ever remember. Oh God, that. The, time the, in that. It's the end of the movie. The 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 machine. I can't remember the name of the machine, but it's what powers uh, their their craft. And this this machine 
was based off of the TV show, and nobody has, nobody really knows what this machine does. And then when they figured it out at the end of the movie, it was able to go back in time seven seconds, and he was able to to basically save the day because he knew the bad guy was going to come in the door. So right. Had to react. I to think it. I, I think Boiler I remember that now. Yeah. But yeah, you could but do yeah, a lot in seven seconds. I think you could. You really could. And and movie, like I said, it's the, it's the best Star Trek movie that was never made. I mean, yeah, it's it, really good. And that whole seven seconds again, and even to a degree, this article is based on the principle of quantum uncertainty. The idea that, uh, and and this is really way down the rabbit hole, but all the things that are currently happening may not have happened yet. We're just seeing diff- uh, potentially seeing superpositions that are possibilities, and we're assuming that they are reality. That gets really deep. Uh, and I don't that know does. That that's a great that. rabbit hole, though. Mm. Hey, Yoda it- said, he said, the future is always in motion, right? Difficult to see. It's always in motion. Right. Well, yeah, and then you begin to dissect the relationship between time and space, and you start to, uh, uh, you know, literally unravel everything you thought you knew about the universe. Because if it, if time and space are truly connected, then we're just moving through what would actually be um, space time, which is yeah, 100%. Like a hundred percent mind boggling. So the whole basis of relativity. Yes, but it seems and- to make sense that time and space are connected right like i mean it, yeah. it but you well, think we, they were we like, know they are but but our everyday reality doesn't speak to that our everyday reality says space is one thing yeah. time is one thing but in reality we, well, we operate it we only operate through it in a four in four dimensions it, well that and we only operate i mean we're not traveling large volumes of space frequently right. You know, like it, it really, and this goes back and I actually just saw this the other day and it was right before I talked to you, Mike, and you invited me on. Uh, it was in the fifties. These two gentlemen wanted to create a functional experiment to test general Einstein's general relativity. Uh, they bought two plane tickets uh, for like a total of $8,000, something absurd like that. And they flew around the world in opposite directions with synchronized clocks and then compared the time of the clocks at the end of the experiment to functionally prove relativity. And I was like, that's mind blowing. But when you take that and and you adjust that calculation for, you know, like intergalactic travel or even just between stars and you start taking those huge chunks of space, the difference in time relativity jumps, I mean, by orders of magnitude. Yep. Mm. They have to constantly, you know, uh, about 22,000 miles up, we have a bunch of GPS and communication satellites and things like that. And they constantly have to uh, adjust for relativity because those mm-hmm. things are going so fast. They're so high up there and they're in such an uh, oblique orbit compared to the Earth that, yeah, they're actually uh, periodically adjusting for relativity for the time difference between uh, how time is passing on the satellite and how time is passing on it. That's something incredible. they have to regularly adjust for. Uh, Carl Cartesian wants to know, Chris, is Chris familiar with the work of David Pears creating warp bubbles in a lab? Oh, is he? Uh, so that I don't know who that is. I mean, people ask me about him all the time, and I haven't looked into his research. I'll admit, I will say that the warp bubble story that everyone's been waiting on for me is a real warp bubble that was really created in a real lab by a real researcher funded by DARPA. And Monday morning, you'll all get to read about it. So, David uh, Paris, you know, it's somebody people send me information about him all the time. Lots of times people like that are theoretical and they're working. You know, people send me Dr. Eric Davis stuff all the time, too. Theoretical science is neat. I do occasionally report on it. I try and really report on stuff that people are actually doing. So uh, this warp bubble story that everyone's been waiting on uh, from me is a real warp bubble that was really made. It's not a it's not a theoretical paper or an, or an idea of something that could happen. So. Uh, Join the technician says, but did you know you can make space time with radio waves? Uh, and for those of you who don't know, join the technicians is, um, gosh, I can't remember your name, brother, but you work with Mark Sokol at, uh, at the lab. I can't remember oh, your at name. Falcon at space. Yeah. Falcon. Yeah. I got another story coming out about Mark too. That's pretty crazy. So do you, what's he been up to? So, uh, this is a story about something he's dealing with in his life and his, uh, his belief in UFOs. And it's a really compelling story. So. Uh, that'll be coming before the end of the year. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the uh, is oh, look, hey, Chrissy's here. Uh, Chrissy's here. Uh, what was that about radio waves and space? Uh, he was saying that space time through using radio waves. I'm curious what the ah, by, it's Jeremiah, 
from Apex, co-founder oh, okay. of Apex. Yeah. I'm uh, curious he was what saying he by create radio or create space time. Yeah, if you could elaborate on that, Jeremiah. Uh, he was saying radio waves can create space time. I believe. Mm-hmm. We'll come back to that. Hi, Chrissy. Good to see you. Um, uh, and then Jazz says, hopefully Brooks is aware that satellites have to adjust for relativity. That doesn't mean you can travel backward in real time. Yeah, that's, I wasn't saying travel backwards at all, just that you would be traveling at different relative times, according, yep. you know, moving through different areas of space at different speeds. Right. Hmm. Right. Um, all right. So I, I'm curious. Uh, I know you can't give us any specific details, Chris, about uh, the Warp Bubble article, but is there anything that we should be looking out for? Uh, for that for that Monday article, um, so I have a lot of direct quotes from the researcher involved. As I mentioned uh, to somebody on Twitter the other day, it's DARPA funded research, so this isn't somebody in their garage toying with something. Uh, it's uh, some leading people, and I'm relatively confident when you hear the name of the lead person involved, people will go, "Oh, I know, I, I know who that scientist is," and. I know their relationship to this field. And uh, it, it's really, you know, I would like to come out here and say, uh, you know, people have been cagey with me and whatever. Now, I've had a lot of this information in hand for a while. And uh, I was waiting for the last few drops from this person. And the last one I got the other day, I mentioned, and, and it'll be one of the leads in the article, but it basically says, Chris, this is not an analog, which was the term I was using in my research. But they created an analog to a warp bubble. He says this is an actual warp bubble, hence the mm -hmm. excitement. And wow. so that so will be in my article. So I got that text message the other day. I got an email more or less saying the same thing. And uh, some actual uh, imagery that was done in the lab, uh, a showing, uh, uh, you know, under a, a, like an infrared camera, you can see the actual curvature of the bubble. Uh, they give the scale of everything involved, so it's pretty. It's pretty cool, man. It, can, it's, can you give us? Can you give folks some context on like what that actually means? Like what what does a warp? What is a warp bubble? So, um, in the like the classic design uh, done by a, a mathematician, Mexican mathematician Mikel uh, Alcubier back in 1994, that was the original design. Was this the idea of? <clears throat> A, a, a localized area of space where in front of the vehicle you had negative energy and behind it you had positive energy and you were essentially contracting space time exactly what we were just talking about to shorten the distance so you're essentially traveling through space without any actual motion within the space itself so you don't have uh, um, uh, sonic booms uh, you don't have the other issues with actually traveling through space so a warp bubble is exactly as it was described. It's interesting that science fiction was using the term warp bubble before any scientist had ever laid the idea out. Even in the 80s, the late 80s, when Star Trek The Next Generation came out, they would regularly say, oh, we have to reestablish the warp bubble. <laughs> and so it really wasn't until the 90s where Alcubier did that. And then I think like 2010, a guy from NASA, Sonny White, who was like a, a warp guy, he kind of refined it down. So the, the, the model that people use a lot is the Alcubierre white warp drive. But more or less, that's the idea is creating this area of localized space that has the dynamics that let you travel at warp, that let you travel uh, in circumstances that don't violate uh, um, uh, general relativity. Right. So would you be able to <clears throat> reach light speed with a warp bubble? Oh yeah, well, see, that's always been the been the idea and the goal. So there's, uh, you know, I don't know that this warp bubble I'm reporting on again. I don't want to blow my whole story before it's come. I don't know that it's something any of us are going to climb right in and fly away. <laughs> right, but it is real, and it is, you know, the idea is if we have something real that's that works. Now we're talking about materials and scaling, and it, and it goes from a theoretical physics challenge to an engineering challenge. So right. that's the big break here is that. The theoretical physics, the idea of a warp bubble became mathematics in the 90s and is now a proven phenomenon in a laboratory. It's a real thing. That's and amazing. I so, and that's I think the really important thing to go along with that is, uh, I think, Luis, you asked, um, would you be traveling the speed of light? So you wouldn't be traveling. And I think that's the important point. 
is that right. the space is moving around you. You're not moving through space. So all of the issues that we have at moving near light speed and all of the energy concerns there get completely wiped because we don't have to deal with Newtonian physics at that point. Well, how about the time aspect of things, though? This time still, like, can you can you go from point A to point B, say another planetary system, and come back and your kids are still alive? You know what I mean? Ooh, like, probably question. not. No, because your time would be relative to your position not relative to the position you left from. I mean, that's super theoretical, and don't right. do not quote me on that. But I mean, from. But wait, I thought I thought well, it was I it did, was the I, fact. Sorry, I thought it was yeah. a matter of going through time that actually caused the aging process to be different. So a warp, right. a warp drive. I thought that would keep you in the same time. I don't know. That's, the that's my understanding, Michael. No, I think you're my understanding from the researchers I talked to, and I've written about five different stories about warp travel and different warp theories, even a guy who was trying to patent one, a group of scientists, uh, Dr. Eric Lentz's warp drive, which is a pretty uh, robust theoretical model. And uh, that is exactly the idea, is rather than going in a rocket just shy of the speed of uh, light and, and traveling to, say, Alpha Centauri and taking four or five years to get there and back on Earth, everyone you know is aged 100 years and died and that time has passed. You turn around and fly back another four years You've aged eight years and 200, 300 years has passed. The idea of warp drive is exactly not that. The idea of warp drive is that that manipulation of space time allows you to travel those immense distances without suffering what they call relativistic effects. So yeah, right. and actually, it's it's the theoretical right. model of a warp drive in, in the ideal sense, uh, yes, you, you, you would be able to zip around the cosmos and be more or less operating... Uh, within the same local space time in your environment as the local space time of uh, of the uh, where you left or where you're going. That would be sick. Yeah, and that, and I would you're you're correct because I was wrong in the way I was thinking about that. We, the travel itself would not have any relativistic effects. The only thing that you'd have to potentially equate for would be uh, would be if time is moving at a different relativistic speed at where you're yep. at or where your your end point is during the time right. you actually spend there. Yeah, something the head of NASA brought up uh, recently, you know, Bill Nelson brought that up recently, that this idea that in different areas of the galaxy or different areas of other galaxies or the cosmos, that because of the, the, the action of the matter there, the physical matter there, that there was uh, places where time is passing faster and places where time is passing slower and things of that nature. So, yeah, I think that's a good point, Brooks, that uh, depending on where you go, you might go somewhere, like you might go somewhere that has a massive gravitational field, right? You go right to the edge of a black hole. And because of that gravitational field, you're experiencing relativ relativistic effects, and time is just traveling different for you than it is for around you. So that's when you, that's sure. when you turn the warp bubble off, though. Yes, you can exactly. still you can you can still travel to that black hole, chill out in your warp bubble, and then come back, and everything should be okay. It's right. the moment. So I'm like, I think of Dune, that mo new movie Dune, where it's almost like an yep. instantaneous star travel, and they're there. Um, and but that is interesting that depending on the gravitational pull of that solar system or that planet, time is obviously. They, Every, every solar system we're going to go to is going to have a different year. Like 365 days is not going to be the standard everywhere else for a year. You know, well, that yeah, could be 500 days. Yeah, period, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So, um, man, that's wild. So, like, what would be – there's two things that sort of come to mind on this. The first is, has the government already figured this out? Um, because if we're doing this in a lab, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know if, uh, you know, if other entities have been playing with it. I don't, I don't want to come out here and say the government doesn't waste money because the government definitely wastes money. But when people like DARPA, who do have a, 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 a not an unlimited budget, and they are farming out to these kind of individual groups to do different types of research and stuff, because the vast majority of research from DARPA, the Air Force Research Labs, a lot of these big military organizations are all done at universities or private organizations that have the laboratory facilities to do it. So I don't think they're throwing money at people to do warp research and they really already have a warp drive aircraft. So I, I don't think that that would be my impression. Uh, you know, it would, why it, it, it doesn't add up. It doesn't seem like something that would make sense to me. So, but what well, does add up is the idea that uh, you're now broaching this idea of going back in time and we're broaching warp bubbles. So Tic Tac may be headed back from the future. That's all. <laughs> I'm just putting it all together for you folks. NMUAP no, with a $5 donation. Mike, 
Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Me, yes. No, real quick, ahead. I want to go. I, I, I do want to hear that. But NMUA feed says five dollar donation. Does this article relate to the NASA attempt to break the sound barrier without a boom? So NASA's attempt to break the sound barrier without a uh, without a boom has to do with I understand like lasers and then disrupting the space directly in front of the vehicle. So you don't have the same reaction with the fluid that you're trying to, you know, you, that you I deionize nitrogen is, is the concept is? behind it. Yeah. It, it's to take the electrons off of the nitrogen molecules in the air. I was actually just reading about this. This is not oh, something okay, I just great. generically know, but you would remove the uh, electron. Uh, yeah. The ionized electrons from the nitrogen molecules in the air, and it would not produce a sonic boom potentially. That's the theory behind it. And why would that be important? Just to, oh, just to... Uh, so if you're shooting a hypersonic missile at somebody, they don't hear it coming. Yep. 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 Or, you know, for traveling over, uh, the, you know, big thing with the Concorde was it could only fly over the ocean, right? It would, right. It would fly between the west coast of the U.S. Or, or I mean, the east coast of the U.S. and Europe, or the west coast of the U.S. and Asia, but it couldn't really fly over land because of those sonic booms scare the crap out of everybody. And it happens over and over. So yeah, the idea of, Ultimately, having like hypersonic travel, just like a commercial jet, you could get on in Florida and fly out to visit Luis for the weekend and be there in an hour and a half because you went Mach 4 uh, or Mach 3. It would need to be able to fly over land to do that. So I think that's a big part of that uh, experimentation. And yeah, like like Brooks said, don't want the, the bad guys to know the missile's coming if you shoot it out. So. What are the other um, applications that this could be used for other than flying from point a to point B really fast like what other where else could this kind of discovery take us to as far as um you know uh, which discovery other, uh, the, the, the discovery of a war bubble the, the 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 ability to possibly create one of these things in a lab and who knows put it around a vehicle but where i guess my question is how else would this technology make society better other than in just travel yeah, well, I think, you know, I think a lot of people believe that the Tic Tac UFO may be exactly that, may exactly be the re the way it moved around, the fact that it had no uh, uh, sonic booms, the fact that it could go from 80,000 feet to 50 feet and, you know, a, a, a blink of an eye. Uh, so I don't think it's unrealistic that that's what we're seeing there. As far as the benefits of warp drive, I mean, on one hand, just financially, Think of the money we spend supporting space programs, going to Mars, going to the moon, things like that. Think of it just from a dollar value, the change in travel. It also just opens up the cosmos. It opens up the idea of, hey, we picked up a neat radio signal from Alpha Centauri. Let's jump in the ship and go check out and see what that was and see if we can uh, uh, see what the origin of that was. Uh, I also think there's applications in non-superluminal travel. You know, I've, I've talked to researchers that are into this and they see this as an op option for uh, uh, for not going light speed, just going really fast. So yeah. Uh, what about transport? Is, what hey, about Chris, transport? Chris, you invented a rocket engine. Can we use it for something other than blasting rockets? I mean, we probably could, but yeah, I do think the main idea of a warp drive is to be a drive to travel. What about in infrastructure and transport of- Like of logistics? Yeah, of physical objects. Like if if we needed if there's an earthquake in Costa Rica, can we get, you know, can we get stuff there instantaneously? Or what about just moving cargo ships without having to utilize fossil fuels and right. destroy the ocean? I mean, that's really a possibility. We're still talking about massive amounts of energy, so even if we had like a low energy warp drive or something like that, the energy investment, I hate to say it still makes sense to pop all that, that cargo on a ship and pedal it over here from uh, Asia to the U.S. wherever, then uh, try right. to use warp drives for a little. But I mean, this, this all comes back to this idea of the singularity, right? Like once you have fusion technology, once you have warp speed, you know, warp drives, once you have AI intelligence, once you have quantum computing, all of these things are going to interact so extraordinarily that, you know, that everything just changes and there's no way for us as shitty futurists to predict what's going to happen because all of the it's it's the complexity of the interactions right. of the technological growth that we just there's no way for us to grasp. Well, yeah, I, I think, I think most, oh, go ahead bro. No, please Chris. 
I, I just think most likely I was just going to make a bad joke and I was going to say just most likely what we're really doing is building a really cool spaceship design for the AI robots that take over and kill us all so they can fly around the cosmos. <laughs> that's, that's what we're really, the Terminators will have the coolest spaceships. The best ever. spaceships. Uh, what I was going to say is that actually the warp bubbles may have uh, um, benefits when we start to think about quantum computing because the ability to move very small pieces of matter uh, even without relativistic requirements becomes a huge benefit. I mean, when you start looking at electrons being moved around for computing and processing and we can move them without things like friction and without things like, you know, heat from entropy or entropy Absolutely. from heat rather, you start to get benefits there too. Not the same as moving a, uh, a shuttlecraft, but. Yeah. I just wrote about a, uh, a researcher who uh, proposed an idea and they have a paper on a ship that can go up into the atmosphere, uh, uh, into a, a low Earth orbit, and basically grab a bunch of these uh, pieces of junk, a bunch of the space debris, uh, using gravitational waves, where they would put a, a, a pair of magnets out, and it would create a wave, uh, basically a magnetic gravitational wave around the target, and they can manipulate it like a uh, uh, like a tractor beam, like a tractor and, beam, That's and cool. and exactly to what Brooks was saying, that technology exists. And the reason these people wrote this paper, they had developed it for eye surgeons, for eye surgeons to be able to take little tiny things that they put in their eye and move it around without physically touching it, but mm. actually move it around using the electromagnetic energy to precision deliver either a surgical instrument or precision deliver drugs within eye surgery. So these guys had developed this and said, man, we can use the same mechanism to put a spaceship up that just goes around and grabs satellites and, and junk, space junk, and just deorbits it using that. So exactly That's what so um, cool. Brooks is saying. There, there are types of technology out there specifically designed to that move stuff at a really small level without touching it. Do you remember the little, the little kids game that had a dude's face that kind of looks like mine, and then you use the thing to, like, use oh, magnets uh -huh. to, like, put hair put on them and yeah. put, like, mustache <laughs> <laughs> wow, man, there's not one millennial or anyone past a millennial that got that toy. There's, there's, there's no way. <laughs> I'm a millennial, us? and I do remember that one. So. Do you yeah. remember that one? Yeah, um, that one. Well, what I was going to say... Uh, I just want to thank M. Brian real quick for the $20 oh, yeah. dono. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Luis. Well, Chris, I, I'm when I think of power requirements, I think of the Hadron Collider and just that massive, massive complex to smash two atoms together so we could take pictures of it. <laughs> just seems like a lot of energy and resources and time and management. Is how big, I guess, of a laboratory did they have to create to produce this war bubble? Is that asking too much detail for of this article? Like, is it? Yeah, you know, let me let me do this, Luis. I don't want to I, I don't want to blow the steam out of this story before I put yeah. it out on Monday. But Fair. I'll tell you, it, it's a legit lab. I mean, yeah. this is a real facility that's established, you know, in an interesting way. So, right. Um, so, but, but I mean, oh man, yeah. Like, is that what I'm I thinking? I know you of, want to interview. What, 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 I'm what, sorry. What, what, I meant to have it out. I mean, I no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. Look, we'll find out next week. I can be patient, but I'm just curious. Like, I guess then, how far do you think we are? from taking that warp drive technology um being able to manufacture it that so it's affordable for say an elon musk or a shipping uh companies or even the government to buy and and use to clean up satellites like are we far away from something like this or is this something we see relatively soon within our lifetime Every debrief article has a formula, and the last section of every debrief article is the outlook, and I'm sure that's part of his. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah. outlook is definitely like, where do we go from here? You built a warp bubble, right? So, yeah. like, uh, how long before there's a practical application from this uh, this breakthrough? That's a it's a fair question. It's a question that I do address in the article, and uh, it's not a it's not a nothing answer. It's not a. Eh, uh, well, it, it happened in a lab. It'll never happen. There is an yeah. answer to that question. It's just not something I really want to if do. If anyone wants to take bets, I want to say 13 years. I'm going to give my over okay. under on 13 years. <laughs> okay. I don't I would... give a timeline in the article, Brooks. Thank uh, you. Uh, okay. Well, well, shit. Brooks went 13. I'm going to go over. 
Okay. 13. You take the That's over? the safe bet. I'm That's the safe bet. I'm going to take the over. I'm going to say 17 years. Okay. Uh, if we're playing prices, right rules, I'll take 16, please. It's, okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, Michael's gonna with one. It's next year, yeah. and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we're all wrong. Next year, we're gonna have a brand yeah. new warp warp drive. We're flying in it next year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's sponsored by the debrief. I mean, I can't think of a better, like, more interesting. I, I know, like, we're all sitting here going, the world is burning around us. Like, right. it's horrible. Everything is terrible. Everything yeah. is awful. But at the same time, like. It's amazing. We're, yeah, <laughs> it's so amazing. Well, like I'm blown away by the possibilities this, of the next 10 years. This is the best thing about this job, Mike. So you and I talked about it in the early days uh, of the debrief. It's literally the best thing. And you guys are more or less doing the same job or a similar version of that job is getting out there to the front lines of these brilliant, brilliant researchers. And I wrote a, se- a Thanksgiving piece on the debrief. And one of the segments was called I'm Dumb. And I just basically broke down really how smart these people are and how blown away I am when I deal with a lot of these researchers out there. And these are really, I mean, a lot of women, a lot of men, a lot of just brilliant people in science that I talk to every day at this job that are, their minds are so far ahead and thinking about things we haven't even considered with these applications. One thing I'll keep in mind, Luis, on a timeline here on things, keep in mind, you know, We've been creating antimatter for a little while now. We still don't have an antimatter rocket, right? Mm. So uh, creating a warp bubble towards actually being in a warp craft is, uh, I would compare the engineering on those two. I would say it's real. It's something we've accomplished. Material science, energy science, other things will have to continue to Mm. advance. But these researchers can look at those sort of things and go, this is the root to that. This is right. the root. Once you have the, once you, you know, I always call it zero to one. I tell people all the time, I go, once you're at one, going from one to a million is just scaling, right? Yeah. So okay. zero to one is the magic. We're at one. Right. Work drive is at one now. Wow. It's not at zero anymore. Well, does that give you hope for humanity? Do you think we survive this this feeling of what Michael said? Like, <laughs> oh, the that. world is burning. You know, <laughs> World War Three. Do you think? Do you think we'll 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 even make it to? I, I don't like fancy World myself a futurist like Micah mm. Hanks and the other guys at the debrief. But uh, when I look into humanity's future, when I try and do the Yoda and look into that moving future and see where I think we're going, I honestly feel like. There's a big effing nightmare coming between the environment and overpopulation and all of that. I think that bubble bursts in a positive and negative way. And I think 50 or 100 years from now, when the dust has settled from that, I think we have a good chance of moving into a a much more utopian, much more scientifically advanced society. Type 1 civilization. Enough crap is built up behind the dam that I don't know... You know, man, I I wrote about Twitter the other day and I wrote about astrology. I don't know if you guys saw this article I wrote about astrology, but, you know, belief in pseudoscience is up. Belief in conspiracy theories is up. And uh, at least in America, we we stopped investing in education in about 1980 and we started slowly scaling it back. And uh, I think around the world, it's always an easy place to take away from. But because of that, we have a very superstitious believing supernatural believing and i'm not discounting supernatural beliefs i'm just saying we have people that discount science which has provable mechanisms to support it and fully embrace pseudoscience and conspiracy that have nothing more than a feeling can god that feels right to me you know so i'm gonna go with that so yeah i I, i'm not hopeful for the short term uh but i do think long term I think when we go from 8 billion people to like maybe 100 million people left behind. 100 you know, million? Not a earth, billion? I'm hopeful for the me. Jeez. Wow. That's a that's a Weak. huge cut. That's, <laughs> that's my bleak. opinion, man. No, just, nobody's you know, making it. Are you it sounds, it sounds like, it, 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 it's, it sounds like society's going from zero to one right now. Yeah. You know, and it's the other thing, too. We might societally and technologically, technology is so new. 
we're in this weird kind of adolescence too. It does make me want to ask the reach out to the UFOs, the guys pilot them, because I believe they're from another planet. And I've said that in the last article I wrote. And uh, I, I do. I would love to to go out to to a, an artificial intelligence or a sentient being that has that knowledge and experience of a couple of billion years that says, "Oh yeah, we've seen societies like yours come and go." And this is either just an adolescence and you're going to get through it, or there is a great filter and most, most societies destroy themselves. So I, like I would love to have that question answered. I would love to have a, have a, a non-human sentient intelligence that's been around for a while or, or has that knowledge tell me, uh, are, are we going to get through this uh, positively or negatively? But we're building up to something, man. There's a, just population alone, environmental yeah. damage alone. Uh, we're going to run up into a wall and we're either going to rise and meet the challenge, which we typically have done as a species, or we're not. I really like the idea of, uh, you know, you run into extraterrestrials and you're like, you know, as a civilization, as a species, how was your puberty? Because ours isn't going so great. Right yeah, now. right. You know, uh, I've got two things real quick and then I've got to run, my friends. Yeah, we got to um, wrap up. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, first, one thing that I want to kind of put in people's minds is when we're talking about this warp drive, we thought it, we've talked about it considerably um, in terms of, of transportation and moving, whether it's people or rockets or anything like that. But in a, at a fundamental level, it's pretty equivalent to, I, I hate to use the word teleportation, but let's use that word just for, for clarity's sake. And if we on earth have the ability to move matter with very, once we figure out the energy thing, without the other considerations, we can solve a lot of this world's problems pretty quickly. So that's a huge, that would be a huge step in the right direction. Two, uh, this is just uh, back to what Le Luis was saying about turning off the uh, the warp bubble as a public service announcement. If you were ever in a black hole um, or at the edge of the event horizon of a black hole, please do not turn off your warp bubble. <laughs> <laughs> you will undergo something called spaghettification. It's not worth it. I promise. Just do the aging. Lose everyone you love. Don't go through the spaghettification. Yep. yep. It sounds like it would hurt. There's a really cool <laughs> video about advice. that, Luis. I don't know if you guys saw that. I read an article in the brief this last week. But there's a video that uh, the Science Education Channel put up. It's about a 12-minute video showing what it would be like to try and actually enter the horizon of a black hole, actually go inside, and maybe even theoretically pass through. And yeah. Uh, yeah, the spaghettification segment is pretty awesome. So. I'll have to check that out. That's great. I, it's and a like cool I said, little video, a little twelve-minute video. I'll check <laughs> it out. Yes, yeah, I'll get the link from somebody. But again, I've got to run. Thank you guys so much. That was a wonderful episode. Chris, pleasure to meet you. Great guest, Luis, Mike. Always you great too, to bro. see you guys. See you tomorrow, we'll Brooks. Again soon. Right. Take care, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Luis. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thank All you, right. Marcus uh, Aurelius. Christopher <laughs> Plain. It's an honor, as always. Um, thanks so much for putting this show together. Thank you for putting the Founder Squad together. Um, give our best to MJ. We love Christy and Christina, everyone over yeah. at the debrief. Uh, make sure you give Mar love. Any any final thoughts or uh, just share with folks where they can find you? Uh, here's my final thought. My partner, the, the guy, my boss is there. I don't know what they're smoking, but uh, I want this closure. And here's what I want. I want the pictures and I want the video. I want all the signal intelligence. I want all that stuff to come to the top, all right? So I think the stuff that Elizondo's always talking about, the stuff that Harry Reid's talked about, these other ones. So I get that they want a temper expectation. And the last thing we want to do with the debrief is tell everyone we've got the answers coming in the next week. But I don't think we're not chasing that. We are chasing that. That is So the guys do their best to keep expectation down. I'm doing the complete opposite. <laughs> the answers we're looking for, okay? I don't think Tim McMillan's given up on trying to get that triangle photo. I don't think the guys have given up on trying to get those videos and that extra information. They Do they want to temper the enthusiasm or the expectation? But yeah, and honestly, I don't think it's completely unrealistic at all to ask the, either this new office in the Department of Defense or the Gillibrand or any of these offices that get created to give us a best assessment at the point, mm. to give us that analysis and say, we don't think it's ours. We don't think it's uh, another human adversary. And we think it's a technological intelligence that's not those. I think we're ready to hear that assessment. So that's what I want. And that's what we're pressing for at the debrief. And I think that's what you guys need to keep pressing for is give us that information. You owe it to us. If you give us all the pictures, you give us all the photos, you give us your best assessment, and we really feel like we've seen everything from you guys, 
we'll back off you and we'll make our own opinions from there. But as long as you're holding the goodies and not sharing them, we're going to keep chasing those goodies. Damn. But not only that, but not only that, it wins them a lot of trust yep. if they do so. Like, yeah, infinite, and I, I really think trust. we're just reaching that point where it won't matter. I said this on Ryan Sprague show earlier this week. I really honestly feel like we are approaching this from so many sides. I mean, if you would have asked me 10 years ago or even five years ago, how about the hot, top astronomer at Harvard doing this? I would be like, yeah. What about right. NASA doing this? I'd be like, yeah. What about a, a, a Congress putting together an office that's oversight by the people? That's the oversight of the people is Congress. Mm. What if the DOD did it? We're getting all of those. All of those things are happening right now. The yeah. UCR is calling for, and the Singularity Lab are calling for uh, disclosure. There's a hundred podcasts. There's a number of websites. And at the brief, we're doing the same thing. So uh, my opinion is we are in a position we've never been before. And we have so many people pursuing an answer that I think it's a matter of time that the worst we get is the raw data. The worst we get is yeah. the military at some point and the government going, all right, you guys look at these pictures and videos. If you think it's aliens, you tell us. I'm happy to do that. Hand the data over. We'll, we'll give you our opinion. If you don't want to give one, we'll give one. <laughs> Chris is definitely not setting any sort of Woo! expectations. <laughs> he, just right, blew, he just blew through expectations like the Griswold did on that family vacation. <laughs> Otherwise, Holy what's cow, the point? Awesome. Otherwise, yeah. what are we doing here? I'm not here for the journey. I'm here for the answer. I'll enjoy <laughs> the journey. But hey, what am I doing here? What are we doing? Well, it almost goes back to that, that analogy that Tim McMillan used, you know, watching the whole football game versus watching the red zone. Like everybody wants red zone. They want to just see the touchdowns. It's pure yep. heroin to the vein. Whereas watching a whole game now is boring. So it's like for us, we're watching the whole game while society is getting kind of the red zone version. We're like, oh, a new UAP office. Cool. Oh, you know, like they, they don't care about the, the minutia of the game. They just want to see the boys. scores. Yeah. We had a 70 year soccer game and the ball just getting kicked around and nothing happened. And the yeah. last four years we've been since 2017, December, I think right around this time, the end of the year, 2017, We've been in sudden death double overtime. So something's going to happen. There's yeah, no doubt. Somebody's got to score. Somebody's got to yep. score. Awesome, somebody's Chris. Score. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Don't let it be Jeremy Corbell. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, if he comes out with the triangle photo, I'll be fine. I'll give it to the photo. Right? I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is, man. It can be anybody. Just as long as the, the, the data is verifiable and good, um, I don't care at this point. Like, if I were in the, the government... Data. And I had those photos. I would just the last point because I know we're way over time. I would link them to Mick West and say, "F you, buddy, do something with that." Ooh, do you think Mick West though would would release them because it would go against his whole his whole existence? That's an excellent question. <laughs> we'll what leave you all watching with that. <laughs> <laughs> and not the hundred million humans left on Earth, as Chris yeah. Plain uh, is uh, concerned was, about. Yeah, yeah, that's a much more positive out outlook. Yeah, on life. much more true. positive. Uh, Chris, where can people find you? At Plain underscore Fiction is my Twitter. I don't really use any of my other social media, even though they're there somewhere. And the Debrief dot org. I write oh. that I'm I'm running the news desk now, so I do three stories a day at the Debrief. Jeez. Wow! Wow! Yeah. yeah. Jesus, Chris, Crazy. what a what a pleasure! Make sure you guys check out uh, Chris underscore Plain over on Twitter. Uh, make sure you Plain go to underscore Fiction. Did I say Chris underscore? Plain? I no, oh, you probably said it right. I'm certain I said it wrong. Yeah. Uh, Plain underscore Fiction is that was that correct? Plain underscore Fiction, uh, and also check out thedebrief.org. Uh, lead science writer at the Debrief, Christopher Plain, uh, posing as Christina Gomez. What happened to you? I was this close to putting Kristen Mataluni under there since she blew me off this week. <laughs> blew me off this week. Chris I'll let her know. On. Oh. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Talk to you yeah. soon. Later, Love you guys. Man. Thanks, man. Ciao. All right. Bye. <laughs> what a great group of people. Christopher Plain, man. He just, whew, he's so funny. And then like, you know, he just keeps me on my toes, man. Well, uh, I mean, join the technicians. Having... Jeremiah wants me to give Christopher Plain his email. I will do that. Um, Chris Plain, make sure you remind me. I'll send you Jeremiah's email. Um, what else you got, buddy? Um, it's tomorrow. Well, tomorrow. It's tomorrow on the Unidentified Celebrity Review. Tomorrow on the Unidentified Celebrity Review, we've got former CIA agent 
John Ramirez. Alleged? Is, gonna be is that an alleged? alleged okay, well, uh, agent? I, I think we're going to confirm 100% tomorrow that he was definitely a CIA agent. Really? Uh, yes, because there was a question that Rather had for him uh, that he sort of had a little bit of a Twitter spat with John Ramirez. And I, so I forwarded the message to John Ramirez and John Ramirez says, yep, I can provide exactly what he's asking for. So um, I think we'll that be able be to confirm, put put the final nail on the coffin on John Ramirez's career, and then we can get to the really good stuff that he's that he's talking about. Because man, he goes from zero to a hundred real quick, and there's a lot that I want to, you know, try and dissect in between. And that's why we've got Brooks coming on. You'll be there, rather will be there. I think it's going to be an awesome awesome conversation with john ramirez so don't miss it because it's going to be a lot a lot of fun uh, i'm looking forward to it yeah um also make sure you check us out on spotify on apple Podcasts, the unidentified review uh unidentified slow review you can also find the singularity lab on spotify and on apple um all of the links are down below right everybody's oh, yeah. links who was on the shows down below so check out the links if you if you enjoy christopher plain if you enjoy micah hanks uh tim mcmillan michael myself all of our all of our links are there so you can find everybody there um and yeah how when do your when do your uh, podcast episodes go up uh same day they go up uh, they'll go oh. up tonight yeah because i know somebody edits them for you right yes yes Man, he's I pretty would be, fast yeah he's he's great he's actually in, awesome. in japan his name is rich uh oh. if you need a guy i know a guy yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, share, subscribe. Do it. Do it. All right. See you guys uh, tomorrow on the Unidentified Celebrity Review. Peace, y'all. Peace. You got the outro? Or should I? I got it. Do you want to know about the future? I do, and I know you do too. <laughs> That's why we do what we do, right here at the Singularity Lab, just for you. Do you want to know about stories about breaking technology, science? Look right here, I'm looking at my sheet. Marty did it, why can't you? Remember, this is a public access channel. We rely on your donations, so just hit the Patreon. So we can continue to bring you updated science and technology, breaking news every single day.